Restlessness, no gravity Will be somewhere in between I'm a ghost to you, you're a ghost to me A bird's eye view, a sand louise Somewhere in between Fast asleep, fly and dream I'm a ghost to you, here it goes to me A bird's eye view, a sand louise I'm a ghost to you, here it goes to me A bird's eye view, a sand louise I'm a ghost to you, you're a ghost to me, a bird's eye view, sound Louise. I'm a ghost to you, you're a ghost to me, a bird's eye view, sound Welcome to Black Sky Legion, episode oh, 135. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is cities in space and colonizing the moon. What? I'm your host, Kaizen, and I am drinking a little dragon's milk. It's been a long day. I was rushing. We started like two minutes late because I was literally updating links right to it. I have not eaten it. This is going to be one of those shows. I hope you guys are ready for some fun. It is Friday, the something of something, 3rd of June. Yeah, that's what it is. And that uh, beautiful song was San Luis by Gregory Allen Isakoff. Go and check him out. I'm going to have the, right now, I'm going to post the uh, link. Let's see here. 
here is the link in the live chat all of the links will be in the show notes after the recording is done and we're also going to have them available from now on on the black sky legion discord for you so look for that starting tonight that is a very cool singer who does like soulful stuff it's really good you should go check it out he's going on tour go see him buy his albums buy his merch whatever support artist it's like good shit all right so with me tonight we've got a full house we've got uh wolf dragon in the house say hello to the beautiful people wolf hello hello everyone and i don't have dragon smoke with me today but i am enjoying some of the spoils of my little trip that i went on i have a smoked wheat beer from a tiny little brewery that operates out of his barn and i wish i had bought more of it hell yeah well that's something to look forward to next time that's awesome absolutely hell yeah we also have tweak 74 the main man in the house say hello to the beautiful people tweak and tell us what kind of coffee you're drinking tonight Hello, everybody. Friday night's upon us, and yep, I've got some chocolate-covered strawberry-infused flavored coffee kind of stuff. It's pretty Ooh. good. Nice. No alcohol for me, so I will be uh, your sober tour through this wild and crazy episode tonight. Hell yeah, hell yeah. It's going to be, whoa, it's going to be a cracker of an episode. We got a lot of shit to cover. Uh, we also have with us from the Star Citizen Research Group, we've got Lady Rain Cloud in the house. Say hello to the beautiful people, Rain, and tell them what you're drinking tonight. Oh, hey, everyone. Doing all right? Uh, just drinking some Coke tonight, really. That's about it. Nice, nice. And we have also Elix. Say hello to the beautiful people, Elix, and tell us what kind of fancy schmancy scotch you're drinking tonight. Hello, everybody. Uh, tonight, it's not actually scotch. It's Believe it or not, it's Canadian whiskey that was blended by a former hockey player. <laughs> wow. Um, it's six-year-old whiskey, and it was part of this program that J.P. Weisers did where they got former <laughs> hockey players to come in and make their own whiskey. They go through blending class, and some of the money from the bottles they made benefits the NHL Alumni Association and they use the money to invest into local hockey initiatives like teaching kids how to play hockey and, you know, giving them something to do. All right. Anyway, so, yeah, that's that. so you're sipping a nice, smooth takeoff, okay, you whiskey. hoser. All right. All right. Cool. Pretty cool. much. Right on. Right on. And we also have Chad Lozan in the house. Say hello to the beautiful people, Chad, and tell them what you're drinking. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, just water tonight. Not, nothing fancy. Hey, that works. That works. And saving the best for last, our special guest tonight, you know him, you love him. He's Wintermute. Wintermute, you have been a staple of so many streams that I've seen in the first starting off in the Elite Dangerous community. You were there for, you know, you were always there for Lave. You were there for uh, uh, quite a few, I guess, loose screws. You, you've been in with Elite Week and Black Sky Legion. You've You've been with us for like every episode and i know that you're also playing other games i've seen you i think haven't i seen you in the soul citizens and and around and i know that i've seen you playing the living hell out of no man's guy so why don't you tell us a little bit a what you drink it tonight b tell us a little bit about yourself take a couple minutes and like how you came to space games what kind of stuff you're interested in and whatnot you know well hi all well, because it's stupid o'clock at night in the UK, one o'clock, I've got a huge mug of Lavazza black coffee. Nice. However, yeah, and I mean a huge mug. But it's but because I'm a nerd, it's an a Doctor Who Dalek mug. However, because it's Black Sky Legion, I also have a glass of Jameson's Casky Dish, um, cast mates, cast mates even, Ooh, um, yeah. Stoky Dish and Whiskey. Nice. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, that sounds good. That's that sounds like a good choice, sir. You are living life right. So tell us, let's let's talk a little bit about you, Wintermute. Uh, like I said, I've known you for forever. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do, and and you know how you do it. What kind of games you're interested in? How you first came across, uh, you know, Elite Week slash Black Sky Legion and the and the space games and shows and books and whatever that you love. Well, I first started playing Elite back in September 1984 on a BBC Micro. 
Possibly on the day it was released. Mm, Not wow. sure about that, but it, yeah, yeah, I'm old. Um, fortunate to get fortunate, fortunate to have the um, the disc edition. Oh yeah. Which of course, yeah. The, I don't know whether you know the disc edition actually differed from the cassette edition in that it had mining lasers but no asteroids, and the cassette edition had asteroids but no mining lasers. <laughs> So, uh, oh, elite. Elite, ha- elite not having features on release started back in 1984, let alone with the Elite I was Dangerous. Gonna say, that sounds so effed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but back then it was just Brave and Bell, and they sold it to Acornsoft. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Um, yeah. Um, take us along the first... journey of your space nerd yeah, from that's... there. Yeah, just about to say. And when it was first released, Aconsoft actually ran a competition mm. to to see if you get to Elite first. The actual first prize was a second processor for a BBC Micro. Mm. For what use that was, I've never actually figured out. But you, you basically added an extra six five zero two processor to it. Mm. But everyone everyone who took part and got Elite, who was actually got um, got to Elite, actually had an the enamel Elite pin badge, which you might have seen on the forums. Together with a certificate saying you've got elite status, mm-hmm. something that was never followed up later. Well, they they so, had the contest. They had the contest to give out the badge that people could sew onto their jackets, and then what well, happened was, pin badge. yeah, what what happened or a pin, whatever. What happened was though there was a problem of like somebody found an exploit where you could just kind of auto get yourself to elite, and then so they decided, well, we're not going to then honor that. <laughs> because too many people won or something it was in the first month apparently it was only about 60 people yeah and then so i found out later but this was the same with a lot of games issued on the bbc micro back Mm. in the back in the early 80s that it was so easy to actually go in and hack them Mm. and then you Um, you continued along with your your space uh, uh, career from there. Did you get into some Wing Commander or some Freelancer? I know you played Elite Dangerous. I played Elite. Mm-hmm. Um, there some space games prior to Elite on the Beeb. Um, space Command, I think, was one of them. Mm-hmm. But we'd also got things like their versions of Planet of um, Defender, that sort of thing. Oh hell yeah! Um, it's actually a very good version of the BBC. Nice, and but- did. You... Um, after that, it was more adventure games. Now, I think, in terms of space games, always had an interest, mm. but I don't think I really started anything serious till I bought a PC again in the ninth, in the late nineties. Okay. And one of the first things I got was Freelancer. Oh, so good! Freelancer, Freelancer was so good. Yeah, Freelancer two, stunning games. Hell yeah! Um, saying that, I've just missed out. I actually had the original PlayStation, and of course, had Descent, <clears throat> and. A game called Colony Wars, which I don't think that's well known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, Freelancer. If we could only get that guy making games, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, absolutely stunning. Great. Um, <laughs> who knows? Uh, but Freelancer, Freelancer 2 failed. It what, didn't get big sales. Yeah, it did. That's probably the reason. Sadly, sadly. But, and since then... Um, Came ac- I mean, there must have been games in between, but I came across the Elite mm. again. Started playing that in 2015, mm. um, April 2015, originally on PC. Mm. But for one reason or another, they up- it got upgraded. Not that FDev has ever changed the specs for, for Elite, and my gaming PC would no longer run it. Mm. So I got an Xbox, and ever since then, I've been playing Elite on an Xbox. Hell yeah, right on. Elite on consoles, uh, it was really good, I hear, for a while there. It is. I mean, I've now got a Series X, mm. and the even the the Xbox One version of Elite mm. runs well. In fact, it's absolutely stunning on a, on a Series X. It yep. just eats it. Yeah, tweet- and because of the ray, the ray trace and the graphics are stunning. <clears throat> yeah, Tweaked had told me a while back that he was super, super excited because, like, like even though they didn't quote unquote release a version for the Series X, just the monster computing power of the Series X meant that, you know, he was just like killing Elite with it. It was like, oh, this is so good. 
And yeah, it was, it was night and day difference, really, when I went to the Series X. <clears throat> just the, the fidelity of the graphics and everything was better. Hell yeah. I mean, Hell the yeah. first time... The first time I actually saw it running on a Series X was then was then R when R actually streamed it during mm. during um, COVID. I remember from yeah. his personal Series X, and it just shocked me the how good the graphics looked. I remember that stream. He did a like a two hour stream from his house, from his like living room or whatever, playing on the couch or whatever, and that was yeah, it was really right. really good. It was really good. And it was a it was a really good stream by R. You know, give him credit where credit's due. That oh, was a hell brilliant yeah. stream. Hell yeah. You know um, what? Just between us and don't tell anybody, I kind of miss back when I respected Arf. That was like, man, life was good then. Got to be careful. What I, I, I will defend Arf on, on certain things. Fair enough. However, the the last couple of streams, the, the live stream, what is it, 7 8 with, with um, <clears throat> Zach and Bruce? A little better. I think are, are actually beneficial because mm-hmm. Arf's not there talking over them. Mm hmm. Arf does know what he's doing. I will defend him on that. But those two last couple of streams, because Zach and Bruce are just getting on with it without Arf telling him what to do, have been very good. I like a Zach and Sally. I like a Bruce and Sally. I like a Zach and Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the so- as soon as that, um, <clears throat> Sally's back doing streaming, the better. But we don't know when that's going to be. Everybody send, you know, good thoughts, prayers, whatever you fucking believe yeah. in for for sally because yeah for sure for sure Definitely. okay but you also me- you mentioned science fiction i've been into, yes. into sf okay uh, since i was a kid i grew up watching things like thunderbirds and stingray and captain scarlet oh and some of those and some of those when they were first screened that's just giving how old i am oh um, thunderbirds was I, so good five yeah, uh, four Three, two, one. Yeah. Thunderbirds are go. Hell yeah! I defy anybody to actually say that that doesn't that doesn't stir them when they see the original theme. Hell well, yeah! That is just me being an old fart. I don't know. No, no, um, and and old school, old school. Uh, um, uh, with Doctor Who as well, man. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Doctor Who from John from John Pertwee onwards. Even though I'm actually old enough to remember. Um, not Hart, no Patrick Troughton, but I don't remember Troughton. Mm. Um, things like Blake Seven. Mm. Blake Seven. Of its time. Blake Seven is like the quintessential UK sci-fi nerd show. Like, if you're a UK, like, there's a lot of of US sci-fi nerds that are like, what? But if you're a UK sci-fi nerd and you throw out Blake Seven, that's just like a like a like a 14-inch hog you just dropped on the table. Your nerd dick is strong. The force is strong with this one. And yet saying that it's been said Firefly owes a lot to Blake 7. <sighs> Yikes. Yeah. And I'm going to get hate, hate for this. I can't stand Firefly. Oh my god! You know what? Look, here's Uh-oh. the deal. Here's, here's the deal. Good night, Will. I- I love you, so you get to stay. But honestly, if you were anyone else, I would just hit the little fucking ban from Discord button. Like, look, it, it, okay. Sorry, what art, was that? I didn't catch that. Art, art is subjective, so people, some people like A and some people like B. That's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna. Later, I'm gonna. Some people are allowed to be wrong, <clears throat> and Wintermute is wrong, and he's no, allowed to be no, wrong. No, so it's no, okay. no. Taste is subjective. I mean, later I'm gonna strangle a puppy, but for now, I'm okay with it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Goddamn Firefly! Oh, I'm so. Mm, never mind. Let it go. Let it go. Do you think I should have told you this before I came on? On okay. I mean, um, well, no, yeah. But you know, I, I, um. Sorry, 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 it tries to kill me in the background. Um, no, it's the one. It's the one of Joss Whedon shows a draw. Actually, no, it's not the only one of Joss Whedon sh- shows a draw the line at because Dollhouse wasn't very good. Neither no, was um. You know what? Nevis, but... Doll Dollhouse. I I tried. I wanted to love it. It didn't happen. But Firefly. Oof, Firefly. Um. Now, based on things that I've heard, based on things that I've heard after, like show, I know why you got cancelled. It was nothing to do with the quality Fox. of the show. It's just that Fox. the advertising sold into the advertising sold into it mm. 
didn't was actually was not actually suitable for the demographic watching it. Well, yeah, that, that was the thing with, You're that right. Was the thing with Firefly is not only in that period of time was again sci-fi was not ruling the world at that point in time, and it was on <clears> on a <throat> Friday night at eight p.m. Well, on Fox. Wait, 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 wait. There was like five I, problems wrong with with Firefly. Number one. Fox fucked with it and moved it around from yes, night to night to night. Number two, they settled on the worst night possible. Number three, they aired them out of order. Number four, yes, they, 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 they literally fucked with it in every way possible. Now, here's the thing. Just between us, don't tell anyone. This is a secret. Right now, as we speak, Disney has acquired the rights to Firefly and John Favreau and was it Dave Filoni? Dave I just Filoni. remember Favreau and Filoni who are gods. Anyone who says ill about them, just stop watching right now. Uh, Favreau and Filoni are supposedly like in pre-production brainstorming whatever to do a Firefly reboot, continuation, something. It's unknown. At this time. But Firefly under Disney, that's a hard pass. Firefly under Disney being run by Favreau and Filoni, that's a hell yes. Uh, Those guys, in my mind, until I see some like serious fails, those guys just get automatic. Okay, those guys are like, if I see something with uh Don Cheadle. If I see something with William Macy, wait, William H Macy, whatever. If I see something with uh 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 who's Black God? What's his name? Uh Morgan so, Freeman. Morgan Freeman. If I see something with those people, I'm automatically it doesn't matter how bad the trailer looks. I'm going to watch just because it could be great. Favreau and Filoni, to me, have earned, like, an automatic, yeah, I'll check it out if you do it, because, like, they've done so much good work. And we're going to talk about some more of their stuff later in the show. I agree with that. mm -hmm. The one thing I would say is I don't know much about Dave Filoni outside of Star Wars. I know him in Star Wars. He worked side by side with Lucas for the Clone Wars, and he did Rebels. He created Ahsoka Tano. He knows the Star Wars universe as well as George Lucas, if not better at this point in time. Does he know the Firefly universe? Because the two are not the same. Look, Joshua Betts, the the third week in a row, that guy forgot Black God's name. Look, Morgan (laughs) Freeman, seriously. Morgan Freeman, and I'm not political. I don't get into the whole righty, lefty, whatever. I don't get into race shit, whatever. Human beings are human beings. We're all equal. I don't give a shit if you're gay, straight, trans, black, white, Asian, Mexican, whatever. You're a fucking human being. And as far as I'm concerned, Morgan Freeman, I understand that for older generations, there's a different voice that's the voice of God. But for my generation, and correct me if I'm wrong, like people that are around my age, Morgan Freeman is the voice of God. If you hear Morgan Freeman's yep. voice, you're like, hey, that's God. I fucking love Morgan Freeman. Uh, anyways, real quick, I want to call out. Uh, we have to real quick call out. Uh, I saw Wolf say the Don says hello. Uh, control it on. If you're listening and you're like here. Wolf, pull him up in here. Get him in here, because he's always welcome. But uh, right, let me see about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go first. I mean, we have to say hello to all the people in chat. But first, let's finish up with uh, Winter Mute. Your other sci-fi stuff, and call out any of the stuff that you love. I just want to give you a minute to like. Do your thing. Oh, where, should we, where, where should we start? Obviously, William Gibson's novels. Obviously. Hence the username. Um, Asimov. Asimov, for Alfred sure. Bester. Alfred Bester's an author not many people know, but mm-hmm. they should do. And, and um, Ian M. Banks as well. 
Nice guy. I met him once a few years ago. Holy fuck. Wait, 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 wait. I forget the show. Stop everything. I need to hear this story. You met Ian, Ian M. Banks? Yeah, it was um, a book, um, very well-known bookshop in the UK called Andromeda, which used to be in Birmingham. Yeah. Was having, was real, it was a bit, just move location. And it was for the, I think it was almost the 25th anniversary. Mm. So down there for the grand opening, it was opened by Terry Pratchett. Oh God. Uh, yeah. Nice guy, Terry. Met him a few times. Um, and so um, Terry, cook, Terry cut the tape. Um, Banksy was there signing copies of Accession. Which had just been published in oh. '96. God damn. Um, also, there was David David um, David Gerald, mm. um, Dave Dave Langford, mm. who is well known amongst the community for producing Ansible. Yeah, which is a sci-fi newsletter, and he's won that many Hugo awards. It's they stopped nominating him because it is utterly stupid. And he's made. Mm. Um, um, the illustr- some of the illustrators who worked on the Pratchett book, so Paul Kidby was there. From Discworld? Oh, yeah, Paul Kidby was there. Because oh. the, be- the week before, they just launched the um, Unseen Uni- University quiz book. Yes. Dude, you're like the fucking... What was his name? Uh, uh, Tom Hanks played him. The, the guy, he was soft-headed. He... Uh... Forrest Gump. Gump. Forrest Gump. You're like the Forrest <laughs> Gump of sci-fi, dude. You're like Pratchett and and fucking uh, uh, um. Oh God, how can I not remember any names at all from like uh uh, uh Hogfather and Sandman hey. and uh, uh Gaiman, Neil Gaiman. I mean, Neil Gaiman. You you're like you're yeah. like you're like I yeah Neil- I was there shaking hands with all of the sci-fi gods of my life. Neil Neil wasn't there. But um, so you don't want me to mention I've met Neil Gaiman as well, then? Yeah, you said you met Neil Gaiman. I'm I'm so jealous of you. Um, signing session for Good Omens, ninety or ninety one. Oh, so that was Gaiman and that was what Gaiman and, and Pratchett. Terry. Yeah, Gaiman and Pratchett, dude. Gaiman, Neil Gaiman, and Terry Pratchett. If you put the two of them together, like. I don't know. Non-nerds might be like you know Scarlett Johansson and Angelina Jolie and and uh, what's the Kardashian Kardashian whatever the fuck. Like uh, for me, if you say, "Hey, do you want to meet like the the ten hottest women by whatever standards in the world?" or Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, I'll be like, "Yo, uh, tell those girls." Later, I'm gonna go hang out with Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, baby. I remember Terry when he used to turn up at the Andromeda bookshop, and he'd walk around the shop in on the second on what what we call the first floor, but yeah. you guys call the second floor. Yeah, and he'd just walk around looking at the books, and no one would bother him. Then he'd go down for the session. This would be before he became what's so well known. Mm. And, and so we're talking about eighty-seven. God damn, and Naughty Buddy Wash, you're absolutely right. Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett, Douglas Adams. Put those three together in a room. You cannot tempt me with women. Like, I those three guys, short of like short of like uh 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 Siddhartha and and like like Jesus and Julius Caesar. Those are the three people I'd most like to have a beer and dinner with. Like, holy shit. And Evans 04, George Burns was my god. Dude, oh god in heaven, I get it, man. I get it. But, like, for me, God is... Oh, God. How do I keep forgetting his name every five seconds? Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Freeman. Morgan Freeman is God for me. I get George Burns if you're like a few years older, but for me, I, I like, oh, God and oh, God in heaven, like those, uh, those, those, uh, those movies, I get it. I love George Burns, but Morgan Freeman is my God. Sorry. Well, this is going to sound like name dropping, but I met Douglas 784. Oh, 
Oh, God. All right. You have to tell the story. Tell us quickly. Signing session for um, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. So Long and Thanks for All uh, the Fish. Like, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, I think, might be my favorite of the, is it four or five books of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy? There's like five books to the trilogy. And So Long fine. and Thanks for All the Fish is my favorite absolute favorite so literally if you don't know the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy series it's the like most deep most comprehensive most absolutely serious like psychology uh philosophy books that are disguised as comedy sci-fi brilliant like hitchhiker's guide is the top right below it is the disc series right below it is you know sandman slash american god slash all of gaiman's work tied with the collective works of asimov foundation series most specifically and the rama series and like 19 other things god damn winter mute you like what what is that there's a liquor thing where like he is the most uh interesting man in the world what is it it's like a dosekis dosekis you are the fucking dosekis guy of like you have met all of the people that legitimately if i can meet anyone in the world it would be like the sci-fi gods if you tell me you've met Asimov, that's it. I just have to just boot you from the fucking show because I'm too jealous. They did have Asimov at the Andromeda bookshop, but of course Asimov, as you may recall, had a fear of flying. Mm -hmm. So didn't do a lot of international travel. Rarely. Super rarely. Okay. So Wintermute, you officially are, and everyone in the chat, Give an 07 salute to Wintermute. He is officially the most interesting man in the verse. Slash galaxy. Slash traveler. Whatever the hell. No man's um, uses. Um, one thing I'm going to have to do, guys. Sorry. I'm going to have to just notice something that Shadow Wyvern's put in the chat. Mm. Radio show trumps the book, Shadow Wyvern. I'm going to have to disagree with you. Radio show came first. Ooh. Yikes! The books trumps radio show, TV. Sh uh, okay, okay. Like it's it's hard, but look, look at all of the O sevens to Wintermute, dude. God, why did I? All right, you have to be a reoccurring guest now, like every other episode. You are the most interesting <laughs> man in the verse. I'm running out of people. I'm running out of, out of, out of people to name drop. Are you sure? I mean, <laughs> look. I'm I am so jelly of you already. Let me real quick go through before we get started proper. I mean, we've sort of started already, but fuck it. We do things out of order here. I want to go through the chat and I want to call out all of the wonderful people who are here tonight watching live. Starting with Wintermute, of course. Slyfy, uh Stratobrick, Shadow Wyvern. <laughs> Our, our uh, uh, Nomansky researcher, fucking dude, I love you, brother. Uh, Slyfy said, what a nice song. Elix, <clears throat> you know, we got Elix Perth and Elix Whitehall. And we were, our cup runneth over of Elixes. <clears throat> We've got Suralank 78, Misfit, Raxless Maxim, my girl. We got... Wolf Dragon, the Don says hi. Like I said, Dragon Man, if he's around. We got Sheep Post Modernist, Misfit, Joshua Betts, BC, Misfit, Jay, what a brother, K Dog, Crazy Shack, 48. Strolling down. Abyssinian, I love you, brother. Abyssinian is. One of our staples. He is a regular from the Soul Citizens and just a great, great guy. Uh, BC. 
Cheap Modernist, Joshua Betts, Evans 04, Naughty Body Wash. Scrolling down. Good All 18, Crazy Shack 48, Evans 04, Soul Ripper 101. What up, brother? Scrolling down, scrolling down. So many people in the chat. I just want to say thank you all. I love you all. I haven't eaten. I've been drinking all day and trying to get together all of the notes and everything to put together a good show for you. I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> all right. Let's see. Uh, there we go. We got Earth Serpent as well. Beautiful, brother. All right. Let's get rolling with things because we have a lot of stuff to get to. Tonight, we've got, <clears throat> under the topics, we've got real science discussing one alternative of solar system colonization. We're going to go over multiple alternatives in the coming weeks, but the first one we're going to start with tonight, we've got under Thing Week TV shows, we're going to talk about Star Trek Exchange Strange New Worlds. We're going to talk about the men who fell to Earth, the Orville, New Horizons, Obi-Wan, Stranger Things. I know it doesn't fit, but fuck it. I'm the boss. I do what I want. And a look ahead at season three of For All Mankind that drops next week. We're going to talk about under games, Deliver Us the Moon, Elite Dangerous development no man's sky we've got a lot of stuff star citizen holy shit we've got a lot of stuff all this and more so stay tuned let's see if the plugs work this week Are people not hearing anything for real? Motherfucker. <clears throat> All right, hold on. I'll stop this. I don't know what is wrong with the plugs, but... I don't know. Whatever. Subscribe if you want. Who fucking cares? I, I don't know why of all of the assets we have, there's one asset does not work. And that's the one that's supposed to promote us. Look, here's the deal. This is just a, a pitch from me. If you like the show, please click the thumbs up button, spread it around, share it in discords, whatever. Don't send me any money. I don't need your fucking money. I do okay. Just like... Like, I don't do this for money. I do this because I love space shit. So, <clears throat> please try to, like, I don't know. See if you can spread it around because I love this shit. And I hope that you do as well. That's it. All right. So, we're going to start with real life science. <sighs> Discussing solar system colonization methods. This week, we discuss the concept of O'Neill cylinders. So Jeff Bezos is championing this idea of an alternative to Mars colonization. He's presented his version of space colonization taken from Princeton physicist Ger Gerard O'Neill, who posited the concept in 1975 and 76. <clears throat> Basically... This would entail mining the moon and nearby asteroids and comets for raw materials to build a massive, like several mile long cylinders. These would be lined up with solar panels on the outside for power generation and would spin such that they provide gravitational force through uh, centrifugal motion. They would most likely be parked at Lagrange points to allow for stable position with ex 
uh, external gravitational effects being nominal. Except in Bezos's presentation, he states that he would like them to be in orbit of Earth. So that would require extra fuel source to make sure that you can keep them in high Earth orbit. That's fine. You can get that from Helium-3 uh, on the moon. The humans living inside would, in theory, be living in a luxurious climate. Controlled, sort of idyllic paradise. This idea, as any of the solar colonization possibilities, has both pros and cons to be sure. So let's just run through a couple of the main ones and discuss the sort of pros and cons, and then we're going to give you links for each of those. Pros. In concept, while idyllic, luxurious settings, you would have full gravity, climate control, no earthquakes, no rain. You would just use water to like sprinkler all of your water delivery to, to various plants. You would have no earthquakes. You would be missing all of the dangerous external factors that might be found on any other bodies in the solar system, either planets or moons. You would be mobile. So, you know, you could technically move out of the way if you saw something oncoming. Cons. Let me actually link the video for this. Let me post this up. <clears throat> Sorry. Real quick. Uh, assets, real life science. Asset two. <clears throat> yes, there we go. That is a video for the concept for an, an O'Neill cylinder. That comes from SSI, Space Studies Institute, the roundtable. Sorry. That comes from what if, what if we built an O'Neill cylinder? So the concept here is a, um, <clears throat> world-renowned physicist put together a concept of making like a six-mile long cylinder that would rotate such that the centrifugal force could, if we wanted it to, provide a full one-to-one -one feeling of gravity through centrifugal force it could through mining the moon and other asteroids provide the mineral materials to make everything that we need through regolith and whatnot for the minerals to provide full how should I say this? Like Earth simulation and through comets. Now, some people might say, what's the difference between an asteroid and a comet? An asteroid is a chunk of rock floating out in space. A comet is a chunk of ice floating out in space. So from rocks, you get minerals. From ice, you get water. You mine the two. And combined, you have the ability to provide a 
sort of how do I say this uh, like a facsimile of an earth atmosphere I see Trey York saying very dirty ice well yeah but you can run it through a filter to provide perfect H2O or O2 depending on what you're trying to filter for And between the two of those, you can provide basically large, stable, climate-controlled paradise bubbles of, like, no earthquakes, no rain, no variations of any kind you can program what the atmosphere is you can program what the weather is it's phenomenal in theory o'neill cylinders provide a idyllic concept future for those who can afford to relocate to them. Now, there are obviously cons as well. Jeff Bezos is championing this idea of an alternative to Mars colonization. He's presented his version of space colonization taken from the Princeton physicist uh, Gerard O'Neill. He posited the concept in 1975 originally. Basically, this would entail mining the moon and nearby asteroids slash comets for raw materials to build the massive several mile long cylinder. These would be uh, lined with solar panels on the outside for power generation and would spin such that they provide gravitational force through the centrifugal motion. They would most likely be parked at Lagrange points to allow for a stable position without external gravitational effects. Although in Bezos' presentation, he says that he would like them to be in high Earth orbit. The humans living inside would, in theory, be living in a luxurious, climate-controlled, completely idyllic paradise. This idea, as any solar colonization, has both pros and cons, to be sure. Let's run through a couple of those. In concept, it's a completely idyllic. It's missing all of the dangers of external factors that might be found on uh, any other body in the solar system. It's mobile. Now... Let's focus on the cons for a moment. While some few may live in paradise, there's definitely the concern of creating a permanent um, underclass of miners on the moon and asteroids, uh, comets, etc., that continue generating resources to support the luxurious paradise of the favored few. Without a magnetosphere, atmosphere, etc. Uh, wait a second. I see steam on un stream unavailable. Okay. You're well, still live. So there we go. There seems to oh, be some. Apparently, the stream has been suspended for policy violations. <sighs> what? Are you kidding me? All right. I whatever. didn't like that clip. Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> that little clip of Star Wars, that whole three seconds. Jesus Christ. All right, let's switch to... Hold on. We are still live on Twitch. We are live on Twitch. For some reason, there seems to be a YouTube problem. Uh, I'm going to switch the camera over. It's a stream unavailable. We'll figure it out later. Uh, yeah, the algorithms have been crazy lately, whatever. All right, <clears throat> let's just, we'll go on and figure it out later in the editing. 
where was I? Uh, we were talking about the cons. Uh, we gotten past the magnetosphere and talking about the ridiculous necessity of how many resources to build these things would be. Yeah, there's a mind-boggling necessity of resource, such as to be presumably many order of magnitudes more difficult to achieve than simply making Earth more habitable. I personally feel that O'Neill cylinders would most definitely be a great challenge such that while it might just be the perfect concept for us in a thousand years or so, at this point, it would be much more difficult of a proposition than colonizing another body. If you were to colonize Mars or Titan, you have uh, sort of in situ resources such that it makes it much easier. I, I think. Now, a thousand years from now, sort of hmm, working it out in, in regards to like saying like, yeah, a, an O'Neill cylinder would be a thing. Okay, fine. But at this exact moment, whew, it seems like a hard sell. Elon Musk specifically criticizes uh, Bezos's plan as an absolute nonsense. And I think, again, I don't think Elon Musk would criticize it as nonsense a thousand years from now with our te technological capabilities at that point. But as it stands today, oof, that seems like a hard sell. Now, we're going to run through in the coming weeks other possibilities, i.e. setting up a colony on the moon, setting up a colony on Mars. And, and spoiler alert, none of those is perfect. None of those is without pluses and minuses. But like right now, as much as I respect the idea of an O'Neill cylinder... It just seems to me like it's a little bit outside of our grasp. It's not that it's not a good idea. It's that it's a little bit hard to achieve right now. Now, I'm going to post in the stream chat. Here we go, stream live chat. A couple of links here for you all. What we have here is the link to the video that apparently is a problem for us to show. Uh, what if? What if we built an O'Neill cylinder? I've got Business Insider. Jeff Bezos wants floating colonies in space with weather like Maui all year long. Here's what we. Here's what he thinks they'll look like. Uh, a Business Insider article written by Alexander Ma. <clears throat> I have one of the links that, like, is my absolute favorite of the week. If there's one link that you take from this week and you say, hey, I'm going to go look at this. SSI, Space Studies Institute, the roundtable interview. This is a 30-minute long interview. It was originally uh, on KNET, like, New York Public Broadcasting. It's an absolute musty interview. WNET produced this interview in 1975 with author Isaac Asimov and physicist Gerard K. O'Neill, in which he represents his concept and they discuss the benefits of it. The link is in the chat. What if, published, discussed, what if we lived in space with Professor of Biomedical Engineering at UC Irvine, Ronki Olabisi. She is absolutely brilliant. You need to see that video. An angry astronaut, if, is just Jeff Bezos right? Are O'Neill cylinders better than Mars colonies? Spoiler alert, he thinks not. But for sure, if there's one video that I'd like you to take the moment, the, the 30 minutes to watch, it's the, the 1975 K, WKNET video. Uh, it was on public broadcasting. Isaac Asimov and Gerard O'Neill discuss what like the idea of his concept of an O'Neill cylinder is. 
Yeah, trying to explain fair use to a bot. A hundred percent. It is what it is. I I don't know what to tell you. Like our use is transformative. We're having a discussion. We're explaining it and, and opening it up to public conversation, but like whatever. The fucking the bot is dumb and there's nothing we can do with that. <clears throat> so I want to go around that the hat. Let's let's ask everybody. Um you know, we'll start at the top here. Let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I see on here, Kai, you're repeating the script. I'm a little drunk. <laughs> Whatever. Um, let's start at the top. Um, Just so everybody knows, we are back on YouTube. Yeah, Go no, ahead. we've we've been on back for a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah. So who has concepts with regard or like discussion ideas, whatever, with regard to the the idea of O'Neill cylinders? Now, like this was a thing we saw like a, an exquisite version of back in, uh, what was it, Interstellar. We've seen it in other things where they've shown it. Um, it was like a similar version is uh in uh what was that elysium where matt damon like the idea was the rich elite lived in a paradise above earth while everyone living on earth was in a hell hole of like a post-apocalyptic nightmare uh wolf i know you have thoughts on this go ahead yeah so a couple a couple of things about the idea in general so it's not that we can just go do that right now and in that um 30 minute um, uh, the round table from uh, 74 with Asimov and O'Neill, that they made it very clear, like you would have to have a colony on the moon in order to do the mining there. Cause it's a lot easier with one sixth gravity to get the hell away from the moon and mm -hmm. put stuff in to space from there, just from an energy perspective. It's a great talk um, to very uh, intelligent and well articulated minds. there, just chatting about an idea. And as that was going, I had a thought of, and I'm going to link it in the chat, called the Rockwell Integrated Space Plan. Mm. Um, feel free to click that. That was a tremendous idea that Rockwell, the people who designed the space shuttle, uh, had for plans starting back, um, let's see... 83 is the first timeline, uh, line of the time, and then all the way up to... 2100, where it ends with uh, human expansion um, into the cosmos begins. And it's mm -hmm. like all these different, you know, we'd have to do these colonies here and this, that, and the other. I immediately thought of that, and then I immediately thought of the expanse for two reasons. One, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have people that are out there in either on, on the moon or in the belt doing the mining, getting the stuff to build these things. And then... It kind of looks like the, um, I don't remember what the original name of the ship was in the Expanse that they built for the Mormons. The oh, big cylindrical ship yes. that they were going to go and the be a colony ship. ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, that's where that idea was. And then also, like you said, with Interstellar, um, you saw what probably was an O'Neill cylinder. Um, it's an interesting idea. It's going to take a lot more cooperation that I think is possible right now mm -hmm. but as Asimov pointed out in that little chat the more money we spend on space the less money we have to spend on weapons and so, there's been a lot of great human advancements in technology and knowledge from spending our money in space rather than weapons you're right so the uh, the Mormon generation ship was the Nauvoo yeah. That's right. <clears throat> yep. And you're right. I think more money spent on space, less money spent on weapons. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Anybody else have uh, thoughts with regard to this? I really like the idea of space colonization, but it concerns me that the people who want to make space colonies and are really putting a ton of money into it. Yeah, I know NASA's kind of working on some things like trying to go to Mars, but you know, that the ones that are really looking to colonize space are the billionaires 
and the the turbo billionaires. So that and uh, I'm I'm just thinking like they're they're looking at it from the high level, but uh, I would be much more comfortable if say like this was a joint like NASA whoever ESA whatever project. So because that's a thing be, that we're going to get into go in the coming weeks. But like, yes, I agree with you. Jeff Bezos's idea of O'Neill Cylinder seems to be propagating a, a, a split of like a higher class that lives in paradise and a lower class that toils to create that paradise. With regard to, I, I, that is just not true with regard to ideas of like mm, Elon Musk with the whole colonizing Mars, like Elon Musk is saying, hey, man, the people that colonize Mars, oh, they're going to have a hard time of it. Like, they're they're not going to be living in the lap of luxury. They're going to be people who are willing to sacrifice for the greater good uh, on an, uh, like a, a, a species level. The people who make the, the second jump out to Titan way the far the fuck out there. They're going to be making a whole second group of sacrifices for for that for the greater good. I agree. So, just to be clear, I don't want anybody to think that I am like. How do I say this? I'm not sponsoring the idea. I'm not promoting the idea of O'Neill cylinders, but I don't think I'm that bright. So I'm not trying to tell you that my concept of what is the right idea is the correct one i'm just saying this is one of the ideas in the coming weeks we'll be discussing the idea of colonizing mars of colonizing titan of orbital platforms of colonizing the moon there's a whole host of various ideas i'm not arrogant enough to think that whatever I think is the best idea is what the, you know, the balance of people will think is the best ideas. I'm just pointing out these are the ideas that are put forth. I think colonizing the moon makes a lot of sense. I think colonizing Mars makes a lot of sense. I think colonizing colonizing Titan makes the most sense, but it's the hardest to do when the first step I think O'Neill cylinders, me personally, man, that sounds beautiful, but I think we're like a thousand years away from being able to make it work. That's my opinion. Your Yours may vary. But I want to throw out all of the ideas and see maybe some ideas resonate with people. Does that make sense? Like some like, oh, I think this makes sense. Oh, I think that makes sense. You might not agree with me. So I'm just throwing out ideas at this point, And we're going to then sort of measure what people think makes the most sense. I think the ideal version of colonization within our solar system is on Titan. But I think Mars will, Mars slash the moon both will happen first because they're easier to access at our current technological level. I think if we were 800 years in the future, the most ideal would be set up Titan, then set up O'Neill cylinders, then the moon slash Mars. But I think what we're capable of grasping is going to be moon, Mars, Titan, O'Neill. My, spoiler alert, my personal whatever. I would love to hear from other people what, what you guys think. Hop in on this. I'm, I'm, like, I'm not against the idea itself. Like, I think, you know, let's fast forward 100 years and let's take, you know, whatever 100 years from now, NASA, ESA, Russian Cosmo, you know, whatever the the future's equivalent of that is, mm. if they put up an O'Neill cylinder, let's just figure say they've figured out some space magic to make it work. And if I was a person, you know, a young adult living then, and I had a chance to put my name into a lottery to go up there, 
I'd do it. Probably, you know, unless it was really, really scary. But if Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk is behind it, um, m- m- a while ago, Max in the chat said, I think there's a documentary about this. I think it's called Gundam. Oof. That Spoiler alert, that might not be a documentary. Yeah, it's not a good thing either. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just thinking... Like if it's if it's in the hands of private business, there's there's a huge number of issues that you know, like sci-fi essentially warns us away from that every time. So so I Chad tweaked Rain Lausanne uh, Winter um, Butte. Go ahead. It's a great idea. We're we're a long time from doing it, and mm. of course you mentioned Gund- Gundam, and it's used heavily in that show, like mm. all throughout. Mm. Um, it's, it's the first. I think it was the first show since it was it was produced in the seventies that the, those kind of images was was used in a like a you know TV show cartoon. Mm. It's, it's not really a kid show, but you know it's anime. Mm. And the whole the premise was that, that right. the people in the O'Neill cylinders thought they were better than those on Earth, and vice versa. And that's why there was a war. Blah blah blah. But it's a great concept. I think if we start small and do <clears> some <throat> small things. Like in the next century, mm. and we're, we're we're growing up, it could be something that could maybe be viable. But the amount of material alone is insane. Here's the other problem: if you put that many haves in one spot, and then you put a whole underclass of have-nots all around them to like feed them the resources to make it work, eventually you're going to end up with a terrorist or a nuke or a something. Oh, yeah. That's going to cause failure of that because whenever we as human beings come up with a system of greater and greater inequity, eventually what you end up with is people going, oh, go fuck yourself. We're going to kill the czars. We're going to kill the French royalty. We're going to kill the whatever and overthrow shit and we're going to start over. And when you're in a position where all of the haves are in a position of like, hey, we're in this little cylinder that's completely fucking, like, mm, like exposed in that if you were to send up one nuke, one bomb, one whatever that blew a hole through the external plating, that it would vent out all the atmosphere and every all the rich people inside would die. You're literally just going, let them eat cake. What could possibly go wrong? Like, I'll tell you, spoiler alert, Fucking poor people are going to rise up and kill your ass. That's what's going to go wrong. So, like, the yeah, idea... Or, so, the original a- O'Neill cylinder, the concept was it was going to be at a Lagrange point. But, like, Bezos's idea is let's put them in high orbit. If you put them in high orbit, they're very close and very reachable by the very poor people that you're oppressing to make your shit work, your paradise. That's not a recipe for good things. Um... Wintermute, I know you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, there is a, I mean, two things. First of all, Mars is probably more achievable in the short term than building an O'Neill colony. A hundred percent. Which is why, which is why it's favoured by Musk. Mm. As is the an moon, O'Neill by the way. Co- yeah, an O'Neill colony. Well, that's going to take a lot of organisation. Mm-hmm. Not just, not just actually um, the materials. Mm. You've got to figure out how to build it. If you're trying to build a cylinder five miles long. Mm-hmm. And then trying to get it to rotate so it has an Earth-like gram, you know, about half a G or a G. Mm. That at this moment is something that we haven't achieved. However, one thing you've not taken in, you not taken into account, you could have the haves and the have-nots on the cylinder at the same time. Mm. And if you haven't figured out where I'm going with this, I on five is an yeah. O'Neill cylinder. A hundred percent. It had the you had the, the people, people in the gray. Yeah. You down below. Down below, the yeah. People who origin who people who actually got to the station or fell through the cracks because they lost money. Mm. And or on uh, one story, it actually was actually an engineer, um, whose name I forget, who was on all four or five previous um stations and they all blew up. He yeah. ended up on down below. <laughs> But what? the point I'm making is you can have the haves and the have and the have nots on the station at mm. the same time. Scrounger, I think, was his name. The guy that was he had been in the previous ones and he was like 
touched. He was a little off in the head. And That's right. He was befriended by the guy who was searching for the grail, and he was a holy man. He was much beloved by the, the Membari. Michael, yeah, which was mm-hmm. the Pope of Michael York. Yep, yep. 100%. Yeah, who, of course, who, of course, was the guy who actually um, gave the order to open fire on the Minbari fleet. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he was in the gun room. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, yeah, O'Neill Cohen is great idea. We don't have the technology to build them, mm. and we don't have the resources. Mars probably more feasible, but would you want to go to Mars? No, you want to go to the Moon first, estab- establish a colony on the Moon, get that up and running, then go from there. In many ways, the Moon is as inhabitable as mars it's as unfriendly as mars as a colony but the main However, difference between the moon and mars is if shit goes ro- wrong on the moon you can get back to earth in a matter of weeks if shit goes wrong on mars it could take as much as six to twelve months depending on where you're at in the cycle apogee and peregrine to like get back to Earth. I mean, NASA, NASA has had plans for bases on the moon for years and mm-hmm. going subterranean, mm-hmm. and not just the ones we see that we saw in 2001. Mm. Also, as you say, if it goes wrong, the moon's, the moon's quarter of a million miles away. Mm-hmm. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. All right. Let me go around the hat and let me see. Does anybody have anything else they want to add back? I see. I want to real quick shout out Griffin Gaming uh, RPG in the chat. Griff, we got. A specific shout out to you coming in the show. I just want you to know about that uh, up front. Uh, so, does anybody else have anything they want to add on to the idea of O'Neill cylinders for the purpose of uh, our solar system colonization? Anyone? Going once. Going twice. All right, let's move on. Thing a week. Oh, my God, we've got so much stuff to cover. Right off the bat, let's hit up, uh, let's see, Asset 3. Jesus, i got to move this plug. I've moved my chair. There we go. Asset 3. Hopefully the bot won't get angry. Yeah, right. Here we go. So, asset through, we've got Star Trek Strange New World Episode 5, Spock Amok. Okay, this is going to be a 100% spoiler-free discussion. This show released yesterday. I can't believe I'm about to say this. This ties into something we're going to talk about later with the Orville. Holy shit. This episode, if you see, you should see on the screen the poster for Strange New Worlds and in the background the, like, you know, ba 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 that you know what I'm talking about. That uh that sound. This episode was fucking great. I mean, it was amazing. There were like four stories going on at the same time. You had one story that was, I guess, what you would call the sort of serious ramification story, and that was a, a um sort of Star Trek reaching out to another culture and trying to establish uh, diplomatic ties and like an alliance. There was a secondary story that was some Freaky Friday body swap shit. Like classic Trek. Like let's go back and talk about what are the episodes so far. This is episode five of Strange New Worlds. In Strange New Worlds, they gave us a first contact episode a sort of submarine type feel episode like world war ii submarine type episode they gave us a sort of um uh the the sort of external thing goes amok episode they gave us an outbreak episode and this is a freaky friday body swap ish sort of episode holy shit it was done so well uh they had multiple stories going at the same time. They had the main the the the, the main plot. They had the, the sort of body swap plot that could so easily be corny as all hell, but was done well and was like very 
I don't know how to say it other than it, it didn't. It managed to miss all of the traps it could have fallen into to be corny. They had a sort of a a number one and 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 uh, what's her name Lana Liana whatever uh, Noonien Sung plot where it was like that the spoil sports find empathy with those people that are like up to mischief and and whatever fun. I think the main sort of theme that 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 holds this entire episode together is empathy of like understanding the other and like trying to be open to the other. Honestly, this episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds was silly as fuck. It was sort of on the side, not super whatever. And that's perfect. That's what old school Star Trek did. They wove in some silly little stories amongst the other heavier stories. And this little silly story managed to be, to my mind, fairly pitch perfect. It was fun. It had a great theme. It it had a callback to the 60s track, which based on the music, I think you can guess. It was, for what it was, absolutely pitch perfect in my opinion. Now, I know some of you had to have seen it. Anybody else had thoughts on Strange New World, Episode 5, Spock Amuck? Can't say that I do. I haven't even seen Episode 4 yet. So Holy I gotta catch up. shit. It was so good. Wolf? I don't have enough hours in the day yet, but I'm hoping so that I can uh, get caught up on these things. So that I, I want to watch them. They sound neat. I've seen some little clips here and there. Oh. It looks good. I just Killed don't me. have the time. Chad, Elix, Winterbeat, please tell me I'm not the only person that I've seen it I three times are. in the last day. Really? I, Canadian I, and regional geography locks are bullshit. Bro, I'm not your dad. I'm not judging you. Steal that shit. I'm not saying it yet, All right. But what are we right in thinking it's akin to it hails back to a mock time? I mean... Going on the, on the name of the, it, of the title of the episode. In a, in a certain sense, yes. And in, in another yeah, sense, it's different. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll let it go. But let, just here's the deal. If you're, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, buy it through Paramount+. Plus. If there's not a way to do that at this point where you live, then steal that shit because it's fucking amazing and you should enjoy it. Okay. Uh, I've been keeping up, but I haven't watched episode four yet. Episode four was great. Episode five. Oh, my God. All right. All right. We're going to leave Star Trek behind, but let me just tell you. I'm not joking. I know that Star Trek has been kind of shite for the last decade. This Star Trek is a whole different story this star trek star trek strange new worlds if you love the original if you loved the next generation after season one like starting on season two like season one was kind of meh but season two on the next generation was fucking god tier if you loved uh deep space nine uh, yeah go and see that because it's I'm telling you, it is worth your time. I guess we're going to move on now just because nobody else has seen it. So we're going to move on to the Orville. So <clears throat> here we go. The Orville. Let me put up. Uh, there we go. <sighs> Asset four is the Orville. Uh, I should probably because I'm supposed to. You know what? Wolf, do me a favor. Go through the notes and pull out all of the links for um, Star Trek. And, and just post the links as we're as I'm going through these because there's too much for me to do. As it uh, so, the Orville, New Horizons. Uh, <clears throat> what you're seeing there is the poster for the Orville, New Horizons. I don't know how to say this. I know you're not going to believe me. I swear to God, I know you're not going to believe me. But as silly as Star Trek: Strange New Worlds was this week, and it was perfect at being what it was. It was like a, a release valve. It was 
perfectly true to Star Trek and yet also kind of silly. It was high. It was high jinx. Like literally, Spock says this is getting dangerously close to high jinx, and then they go further. The Orville New Horizons, the premiere of season three, episode one, which was called uh, its title "Electric Sheep." It's an hour long. I don't know how to say this other than it was shockingly deep, dark, thoughtful sci-fi where you thought like Star Trek Strange New Worlds was going to be that. Strange New Worlds was a silly like release valve of like silly hijinks, but like still perfect in universe. And I'm not bagging on it at all. It was perfect. The Orville season three, episode one was deep, dark, and thoughtful in a way. It was as deep, as dark, and as thoughtful as any fucking Star Trek in the history of your life has been. I'm talking going back to the original series. It involved it, it, it explored themes of like like racism, suicide, spoiler alert, there is a very dark suicide plot line in this story that was like honestly the Orville season one I thought it was a mix of like true Star Trek and like comedy kind of Seth MacFarlane tropesy kind of like halfway between Star Trek and Family Guy season two I thought really picked it up and got very like like better but like like season one was still great but season two was better Season three kicked it up, not a notch. Season three, the Orville, they're calling it the Orville New Horizons. They're not calling it the Orville season three. I think it's because, like, whatever, Hulu took it over. The Orville Horizons, and all I can tell you is based on episode one, is E&M Banks level fucking dark, serious sci-fi that is top fucking level incredible wolf has posted links in the in the chat for you guys of uh two reviews that i found incredibly helpful i thought they were really really good reviews the first is um orville new horizons oh so first we got the season three trailer link which which is there for for everyone to enjoy we've shared it on the show last week the, the second link is Jesse Gender After Dark. Um, I don't know this person. I, I haven't watched any other videos from this person. When I see, you know, Jesse Gender After Dark, I don't know. Like, is this some, like, super lefty person with an agenda? All I can tell you is I've seen this video. It's 26 minutes long. This woman does a breakdown of why she was shocked by how good dark hard sci-fi this episode was she was like look season one was good it was a little too jokey to me i thought there were certain things that i felt were like a little flat and a little family guy jokey that turned me off season two i thought they really stepped it up a notch season three this first episode stepped it up 10 fucking notches of like dark gritty interesting really weighty Really stuff that makes you think like like no joke, uh um the outer limit slash uh um uh what was it back at the Twilight Zone, like in its heyday, dark, thoughtful sci fi. Holy shit is it good. The the next link was Talking the Orville. This guy has been like the number one fanboy of the Orville going all through, and he gives his uh impressions with spoilers. Uh, spoiler alert for both of their impressions. They have different reasons why they love it, but they both absolutely love the Orville um, New Horizons premiere. I watched this episode. Now, this episode came out like yesterday. I've watched it twice. It's good. It's, like I said, super, super troublesome. Like, it's not easy viewing. It's not like popcorn viewing. It's really, really thoughtful viewing that makes you weigh out like, where do I come down on this? Because it, 
I'm not comfortable with any of the takes on this. There's multiple people involved here that have takes, and all of them are like, I can see your point, but I could also see the counter argument. Let's go around. Does anybody have anything they want to add to this? Has anybody other than me me seen uh, uh, Electric Sheep, the Orville? Nope. I think think what we're learning here, Kai, is you have a lot of time to watch TV where the rest of us don't. Oh, that's not fair. I've got tons of time to watch TV. I just don't have time to watch what's on at the moment. Fair. The only thing I watched this week was Obi-Wan. Okay. We'll get to that. uh, I'm right there. Too. It's good. It's good to see. Like, I hesitate to say real sci-fi, but like, you know, sci-fi that isn't just commodity. Anyone, like, anyone you know. who thinks that the Orville is like, oh, this is the joke. This is the Family Guy in space. Uh, go fuck yourself. Watch this episode. I guarantee you, you'll be like, holy shit, that made me uncomfortable, and it made me think a lot, and it was damn good. It was Asimov-level, thoughtful, fucking sci-fi. Saying that, Kai, if you've seen seasons one and two of The Orville, there are episodes there that are on a level with Black Mirror. There are. There they, are. are hard, they are that hard hitting. And And here's the thing. There's only one episode out of the Orville season three, New Horizons. It was it, it came out yesterday. The next episode comes out in six days. So who knows? Maybe the next level will be whatever. But this this one was like a dark Black Mirror. I, I've seen Black Mirror. I've seen the episodes of Black Mirror. This one was on par with the darkest of Black Mirror. Like and Black no Mirror joke. Gets very dark. Yeah. It, it, this. This gets darker. This fully on explores uh, suicide from a viewpoint of maybe it's not the wrong choice. Holy shit. Like that level of dark. All right. Next up, we've got the man who fell to earth. So I've been promoting this show from the very beginning, telling you why you need to see this show. Episode 5 came out this week, and it was still on that level, as good as the other levels. If you have Showtime, go and watch it. If you don't have Showtime and have disposable income, go and support it. If you don't have Showtime and don't have disposable income, go and steal it. I don't give a fuck. You do what you need to, but see this show. The, the, The thoughtfulness of this show is... Just, oof. It, 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 I don't even know where to come from on this. Um, and of course, as I've said, every week from the beginning, we have, and Wolf is posting in the chat, the trailer and episodes one and two, which are completely free on YouTube, in North America at least. Go and watch this or put up a VPN and say you're in North America and go and watch this 100% for free. It is thoughtful sci-fi. It is interesting. It is next level good and should be watched. Does anybody have anything real quick before we move on from the man who fell to earth? The only thing I will say, can I use... I actually was aware of this a few months ago Mm. because I saw some trailers and originally I was very wary Mm. because it looked as though it was a remake. Mm -hmm. After reading some subsequent um, pieces, it's a follow-on. Even to the fact that, as I put in the chat last week, the Bill Nighy character is the Bowie character from Nick Rogue's original film. 100% so, yes. And not only that, but uh, in in, so the, 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 the 70s film with David Bowie... Remember, there was that '70s film with Baby David Bowie. Was like it was, it was a '70s art house film. It was like halfway fi- like art house and halfway like softcore porn. Like, I legitimately I went back and forced myself to watch the '70s version of the movie, and it was like Jesus Christ! I did not need to see Rip Torn's penis. 
But like, okay, whatever. Putting that aside, in the 70s version, remember how he shacked up with that chick that was originally, she was the the hotel maid or something. She was like the hotel clerk at, at a hotel in New Mexico, and he shacked up with her on the lake and yada, yada. He stayed with her through the whole thing, and in the end, he put aside money for her, and she was like, I don't want the money. I want him. That chick is also a continuing character in the current version of the show as like like I said Bill Nighy is playing the character that Bowie played in the 70s version he literally is playing Thomas Newton yes 100% yeah i mean i remember watching the original film on tv years i mean many years ago were you also um, scarred um, by rip torn's penis i was i can't remember it to be honest oh, he's blocked um, it from his memory Oof. He's better yeah, off that way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with that version. Okay. Um, but one thing I must do at some time, some time is to try and find the original novel because it is an adaptation. It is. It absolutely is. And that, that novel is on my list. I've got like 18 books ahead of it, but it's on <laughs> my list because the, the concept uh, as sci-fi of it is so brilliant. I think it ties into uh, climate change concerns. It ties into the idea of Persephone. Uh, it, it ties into so much. All right. So for all man, sorry. The man who fell to earth episode five, again, a must watch. You have to put it on your list. Uh, moving on. Does anybody have anything else? Before I move on, all right, I'm going to make an executive decision here. For All Mankind, season three drops next in this next week. But I am telling you, legitimately, For All Mankind, like, I love The Expanse. I love The Expanse more than a fat kid love cake. And I'm telling you that For All Mankind is better than then the expanse so instead of just playing you the season three trailer we're going to play you the season one trailer the season two trailer and the season three trailer season one and two are already out and if you have them you can watch them right fucking now you can binge them you must do this if you are a nasa nerd if you were a space nerd and i'm going to explain exactly why and then season three drops next week. And holy fucking shit, I have not been... Like, I am more excited for season three of For All Mankind than I was for the final season of The Expanse. And I love The Expanse. So here we go. I'm going to play you, in order, the, the brief trailer for season one, then season two, then season three of The Expanse. I'm... Look, if you don't believe me about anything else, believe me about this. If you have not seen it yet, you must fucking see it. Here it goes. And then we're going to play the trailer so that we can discuss For All Mankind Season 1, Season 2, and Season 3. And apparently, it's saying that we're, it's cutting into it. It's saying it's some kind of violation on YouTube. Go fuck yourself, YouTube. We're literally discussing a publicly, it's on YouTube available for everyone trailer for the purpose of discussing the show. YouTube doesn't care. Are you? F You're right, but YouTube doesn't care. Fucking stupid ass fucking algorithms. Are you kidding me? I don't know. Maybe somebody is like watching that is maliciously like re trying to report, report, report because the, the algorithms don't normally do this. This is a whole separate thing of some sort. It's saying stream unavailable, stream suspended for policy viol Are you Okay. So apparently We're still live on Twitch, so. Yeah, post the link in Twitch. Um if you're listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube, I don't know what the fuck to tell you other than YouTube is being fucking retarded. Um Jesus Christ. This is literally protected. You're supposed to be able to discuss. <sighs> All right, whatever. I'm not even going to try on YouTube anymore. So. Okay. 
I, I don't know what to do at this point. The YouTube is just dead. Just keep with the trailers and just go. YouTube. No, we're not playing. Where I'm not playing any more trailers because go fuck yourself, YouTube. Trailer two. We've linked trailer two and trailer three in the chat. I'm gonna try trailer three and see if for some reason these fucking idiot algorithms don't screw us over. I, I don't know what to do at this point. We can't even do a show if they're just gonna whatever. <clears throat> Here is Stranger Things, or not Stranger Things. Here is For All Mankind, the season three trailer. Let's see if it will allow it. There's a primal urge in all of us to explore. Some say private citizens have no business in space exploration. I emphatically disagree. We have a historic opportunity. The first mission to Mars. NASA's joining Helios and the Soviets. A three-way race to Mars. We're not gonna come in second place again to anyone. We're talking about discovering life on another planet. It'll change our concept of who we are, where we're going. Black holes. The massive dust storm has obscured both landing sites. Years, even decades of planning comes down to this moment. We're landing blind. Brace for impact. Being first is what it's all about. This is the resource that can support large-scale human colonization. I want to tell us where the water is? The survival of my crew depends on it. When united behind a common goal, there is nothing we cannot achieve. It's only the beginning. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you might be listening to the very last fucking episode of Black Sky Legion on YouTube because YouTube could go fuck itself if they're going to keep up with this bullshit blocking me for stuff that is transformative, fucking whatever. I'll just put this out on a podcast and YouTube can suck a dick. Uh, basically, For All Mankind Season 1 posits a concept of what if the Russians got to the moon first? So Season 1 is if the M Russians got to the moon first and if the Russians as a PR uh, sort of scheme, plan, whatever, sent women up in space, <clears throat> then maybe NASA would have, number one, kept up with going to the moon and number two, also sent women up in space. Um, and and basically the, the entire concept is like, what if for reasons we had incentive to continue with the whole space race and not um, sort of just said, eh, we've, we, we, we went enough. So season one is getting to the moon. Season two is the concept of the Americans and the Russians both put bases on the moon <clears throat> and literally have people like permanently stationed on the moon season three is jumping ahead again another decade for each season there's a decade sort of jump and season three is now we're on mars and season three takes place in the like 90s season one is what if in the 60s we would have gone full ham onto the moon Season two is in the late 70s, early 80s. We're now basing people full time on the moon. Season three is in the early 90s. We're at Mars. And it's clearly a three way race between the Americans, the Russians, and black Elon Musk. And like, I'm here for it. I'm, I, I love the concept. I think everything there at this point, let's be honest, <clears throat> it's between 
Elon Musk, NASA, which is the Americans, and China. Russia's folded. They're not interested in doing serious space shit at this point. But China, America, and Elon Musk are going to be what is racing for boots on Mars. And I just, I love the entire concept. I, I, I'm, I'm here for it. I want to see what they do with this, this show. If you are a NASA slash space nerd, you need to see For All Mankind for multiple reasons. There are so many things in For All Mankind. In season one, they have all kinds of stuff, including the idea of starting a base on uh, the moon, which it was legitimately a thing that NACA slash NASA was working towards when it was originally founded. Uh, it was a, it was literally a thing that we were going towards. <clears throat> In season two, they have the Nerva, which is like a nuclear powered space shuttle ish. That is a thing that we're literally just starting back up now. Nuclear powered. The Russians had an idea uh, of like trying to do and then they sort of backed out of it and we have on the books for nasa now as a thing that i think starting 2026 they're they're supposed to start up the nerva uh program they're gonna they're gonna have nuclear powered spaceships as a as a concept state uh, system uh, uh um sorry uh season three is the colonization of Mars, which is where we're at now. We are literally, like I said, at a three-way race between NASA, SpaceX, and the, the Chinese uh, space organization. There are so many things, including Sea Dragon. Sea Dragon was a real plan set up that NASA had, had which was a, a, a rocket that was a dumb rocket as they call it it was a <clears throat> like a just a massive single stage where you mix two type of propellants together and they explode and that gives you lift and it was so massive that you couldn't launch it from a regular launch pad you had to launch it from the sea because that was the only way that you would be able to sort of get it up it was that massive if you were to try to launch it from any rocket pad you would destroy the 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 pad that it was on that was a real thing so much of what is in this show are real you can like go and google them and educate yourself on sort of all of the what ifs of the uh uh roscosmos of nasa of various governments of like yeah this was a real thing going back to like nazi rocket plans that they had and talking about how Werner von braun basically just brought over his nazi rocket plans and was like fuck it i'll 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 bring it to nasa if you know the the the, the ss the reich is gone Let's do this shit with NASA. He didn't give a fuck about the government involved. He just wanted to build his rockets. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that to protect the man or in any way idealize him. He was a Nazi. And he's guilty of everything that that entails. No defense of that. But he didn't really give a shit. He would have sold out his ideas to the Russians, to the Americans, to the Chinese, to anyone who would help him build rockets. I know that several of you have at least seen some of For All Mankind. So please hop in with your thoughts with regard to this amazing show. Like legitimately... If there's three things from this entire episode that I would love for you to take, anybody listening, it's go watch that half-hour interview from 1975 with Isaac Asimov and O'Neill about the O'Neill cylinders. Watch For All Mankind and play the game that I'm about to tell you about coming up next. Who wants to, who wants to hop in on, on For All Mankind, any of the seasons? For All Mankind was great. I loved <laughs> season one and season two. Looking mm -hmm. forward to season three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one that I actually watched with the wife. She enjoyed that even. And she's not quite the sci-fi fan that I am. 
So that that's one that we'll actually be able to watch together again. So yay, something good. Hell yeah. yeah it was a fantastically well done <laughs> series in season one and season two. Um it it offers the right amount of what could have happened with the right amount of the conflict and everything that goes with it because it's not going to be utopian and it's not going to be easy. And it just, it hit that nail on the head so squarely. Mm. I, I would say, however, that I, I would disagree me personally with your statement that it's better than the expanse. I, okay. I rate the expanse higher than for all mankind. That's fine. That's not to take away from how good how, how, for all mankind is. That's fine. I get it. I, I honestly think you're between the two of those, you're saying like, you know, like the best, the, 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 I don't know, the best coconut cream pie or the best cheesecake you've ever had. It's like, well, they're yeah. both fucking yeah. top no level. Choice. I don't know what to like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. But I, I, I love the expanse. Like, like I can't like, yeah, I love the expanse. Like a fat kid loves cake. I can't, I'm not in any way trying to bag on it for sure. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have anything on for all mankind? Anybody else excited for season three? It, it, if you know me, it... go ahead. I've seen one episode so far, guys, and I was hooked immediately. And I think it's just it's just the little touches. Mm. Things like, you know, the input or the commentary from Nixon, done as though it's from um, the, the tapes in his office, harking back to Watergate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, brilliant. And it's believable. The, the attention to detail uh, uh, from the period is just second to none. Mm-hmm. So basically, um, the Russians were way ahead of us on their rocket program. They got Sputnik up before we got a rocket into or a, a, a satellite into orbit. They got Yuri Gagarin up in in uh, uh, up before we got a person into uh, whatever. Their their Werner von Braun, their father of the the space program, was Korolev, and Korolev died in surgery. And that's literally just the only what if of this. Everything else that they talk about in the show are real plans that were put forth by the Americans and the Soviets both. The only what if on this, the only place where this show zigs where history, real history zagged, is Korolev in their version, Korolev didn't die. And because of that, they stayed ahead. And because of that, we kept pouring money into the space race and because we kept spending money on it and they were ahead, they kept spending money on it. The fact of the matter is, is the only thing that changed in reality is Korolev died in surgery, which means that we caught up and got ahead, which means that once we got ahead, they said, fuck it, it's too expensive and quit, which once they quit, we quit. Had that one thing changed in history, I honestly believe that you could flip a coin. Everything in this show could just as well have been true as what, what we experienced in history. Go ahead. Of course it could. Yeah. But in terms of comparing it with The Expanse, mm. The Expanse is an SF show. This you could consider an alternate history. 100%. A very, very good, a very, very good alternate history. Mm -hmm. But it's a show that, as I said, within the first couple of minutes of watching it, hooked. Hmm. But the one thing it doesn't cover, because it, I don't think they wanted to cover it in the show. Yes, Gagarin was the first um, was the first um, cosmonaut in space. He wasn't actually. We, he wasn't. I he know. Was, I, I yep. was just about to, about to con, go on to, mm -hmm. but we now don't know about all the failures before Gagarin. So there was actually a success. There was actually one success before Gagarin. I forget the guy's name, but there was a Russian cosmonaut. There were like three that they tried and the guys died. But there was one Correct. that they sent him up. He lived, but they blew the reentry. They came in too shallow. And instead of landing in like Azerbaijan, instead of landing in Soviet controlled territory, he landed in China. He broke his legs on re-entry and the Chinese had kept him prisoner for a while. And by the time he got back, 
the Russians were embarrassed by the whole bit because at that point they didn't want to admit that the Chinese and the Russians weren't getting along very well. And as a result, they hid the fact that he was the first successful Soviet cosmonaut to make it into space and come back alive. They hid it because they were embarrassed by the fact that the Chinese were like, go fuck yourself and kept the guy prisoner for a while. Gagarin was the first one that was a quote unquote complete success. So they admitted to him. Well, it's actually thought Gagarin's actual death was covered up. The actual reason why he died. Mm. So he was, he had wanted to, Gagarin had wanted to go back into space and the the, the, the Politburo said, oh, fuck no, we cannot risk you as a PR. You're like a PR victory. We cannot ever risk you going back into space. So they refused to allow him to. And then apparently, according to the official story, he died in, I think, a car accident like 12 years later or whatever, but he was very bitter about the fact that he wanted to go back into space and the, the communist party in China or sorry, in Russia would not allow him to, because they didn't want to risk him dying. Yeah. It's, it's touched upon in that French show missions I've mentioned. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll wait, we'll wait that at that. Yep, we, we, I tell you what, uh, Wintermute, we will put that on next week's show as a, to, to, to uh, highlight that to people. I've also linked in the chat, uh, For All Mankind, cast recap season one and season two. If you watched season one and season two of For All Mankind, but like you haven't seen it in a year or like two since season one, a year since season two, these are a phenomenal recaps that are like a recap of the story put on by the actors who starred in it. You're going to love it. So you'll be ready because next Friday, so like next Thursday night slash Friday morning, the way that these work is they're on Apple Plus. They're listed as being available. So the first episode of season three is set up for being, I already put the recaps in there, Wolf. Season three, yes, yeah. episode one is supposed to be out, released out next Friday. So like next Thursday at midnight slash Friday at one minute after midnight. But the reality is Apple Plus always cheats and they release their shit like four hours, five hours early. So next Thursday night, I will be watching episode one of season three of for all mankind and loving it i guarantee you these recaps though if you have not seen the show in a year watch these recaps you're welcome it's fucking amazing you're going to love it all right anybody else have anything else on for all mankind before we move on because it's already 10 o'clock at night jesus christ all right next up we have a show that is I swear to fucking Christ, YouTube, if you algorithm this, I'm just going to kill the show. I'm done. Next up, we have a show that's technically not space-related, but I don't give a fuck. It is sci-fi, and it's amazing. Stranger Things Season 4, Part 1, which is Episodes 1 through 7, which dropped May 27th. It dropped this week. Uh, season, or sorry, Part 2 will drop on July 1st. Here we go. Dear Billy, I don't know if you can even hear this. Ever since you left, everything's been a total disaster. For a while, we tried to be happy. Normal. I know that's impossible.
located you guys far from Hawkins. Because I thought you'd be safe. A war is coming. I'm afraid your friends at Hawkins are very much in the eye of the storm. I don't have my powers. I don't know how to say this other than just to say it. Without you, we can't win this war. See you on the other side. On the other side. I was convinced I was put here for some other reason. Maybe I can still help. Even if it's the last thing I do. People say Hawkins is cursed. They're not way off. Holy shit. So, the first episode, first seven episodes of season four <clears throat> dropped on May 27th. I binged the shit out of them. They were so good. Hey, look at that, too. YouTube did not ban us. It let us actually play a publicly available trailer for the discussion, for purpose of discussing it. Wow, that's that awesome. Tempted. It might just get us after. Yeah, right. Whatever. <clears throat> Wolf just posted in the chat the mega recap seasons one through three. If you haven't seen, you know, any of it for like a year or two, because it's been like two and a half years since season three of Stranger Things or two, whatever. It's what been all of COVID. Yeah, it's been a couple years since this show came out, and the show's fucking amazeballs. <clears throat> um, this season, so good. Uh, I, I don't want you to worry now. I'm not going to spoiler anything. But I will say obliquely, the first seven episodes, number one, told a good, coherent story in and of themselves. But number two, they also... Re, how, how do I say this? They reshaded the events immediately prior to episode one of season one. They reshaded what happened to Eleven right before she escaped Hawkins in a way that completely recontextualizes all of the entire show. So they they didn't break the lore, they didn't retcon anything, but they simply further explain something that makes you now go, holy shit, that completely changes everything that's come before. Obviously, anyone who's seen Stranger Things knows that you have this tropes, there's this story sort of tropes of the kids start the show off with them playing their little D&D adventure. In their D&D adventure, there's a big bad. That big bad represents a sort of overarching interdimensional, whatever the fuck you want to call it, threat for the whole season. They're not going to break that tropes. That's 100%. This is the thing they're going to ride out till the end because it's, a, it's, it's award-winning. That, the 80s hook gimmick, nostalgia, whatever. The amazing story, the great characters, these are all the pillars upon which Stranger Things is built. 
And this season, season four, part one, the first seven episodes, is as good as any Stranger Things I've seen going back to the beginning. It's incredible. It's incredible. I watched all of it in two days. And on July 1st, I can tell you right now, by the 4th of July, I will have seen all of it. Because if they put out another seven episodes in two days, I still will have watched it all. It is fucking incredible. Tweak, top in on this. What are your thoughts on, with no spoilers... Just but general no, stuff you can say. No spoilers at all. I, I will say this. I agree. It's the best season so far of Stranger Things, and I've loved all the seasons. Uh, my wife and I binge this in about two and a half days, and all of the episodes are over an hour long. They're all like an hour 15, an hour 20, which allows them to tell such a good, well-paced story. It's just pure enjoyment, pure 80s nostalgia, uh, and it kind of has the tropes, the feels, the all the best parts of the old Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And it's kind of thrown into this in a new <laughs> and refreshing way, and it works so well. Interesting that you say that you call back to the Nightmare on Elm Street movies specifically. Robert Englund, Freddy Krueger, plays a part in this show, in this season. Won't tell you what it is. Full disclosure. Won't tell you what it is. No, no, no. no. Not as Freddy, obviously. But that wasn't by accident, man. No, absolutely not. But yeah, this series was great. Loved everything about it. Anybody else want to hop in on this? Have anything they want to add? This is actually the next show that my wife and I are going to watch together. Um, I've seen a little bit of the first couple seasons. I haven't seen all of them. And like it was neat, but I just didn't have the attention span back when they came out because of things that we were up to. Um but she actually found a few of the trailers while she was skipping around on Netflix and she's like, Oh, this is neat. We have to watch this. I was like, all right, I didn't think that was gonna be your speed, but let's fucking go. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So good. So good. Kai, what is on your burrito? I, I don't, I don't have a burrito. I had a piece of toast and beer. Yeah, wow. Okay, I gotta stop chewing toast. My bad. I uh, didn't get a chance to eat, so my bad. Um, yes. God damn, this is so good. I, I, I don't know what to say other than fucking incredible. All right. Anybody else have anything else on Stranger Things before we move on to Thing a Week, the Game Edition? I've seen a, I've seen season one, absolutely mm-hmm. stunning. I got bored during season two and I haven't caught up with it since. <gasps> See, I'll be honest with you. Season one to season two, it felt like there was a drop off until the back end of season two, and then it picked up. Season three was good, but season four is honestly the first where I would say this is as good as season one. My feelings. Just my opinion. Yours may vary. Not going to disagree. All right. Here we go. Let's get into thing a week, the game edition. Uh, I'm going to play you the trailer first, and then we're going to discuss what I think is an absolutely fucking perfect game. We used to call it home. Our pale blue dot. Today, we find ourselves at a crossroads. You're here because you're mankind's strongest. Smartest. your decision and make it now. A new beginning dawns for humanity. 
and it dawns today. All right. That's the trailer for Deliver Us the Moon. Um, I'm going to get into this, and then we're going to circle back. I forgot. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot this, but I forgot Obi-Wan. We're, gonna, we're going to cover Obi-Wan for sure. I skipped ahead on, on through there because I was so pissed off at the previous thing where it was blocking us. <clears throat> Deliver Us the Moon, in my opinion, is... An absolutely, and I mean this, absolutely perfect game. This little indie award-winning gem from developer Kyoken Interactive can be found on Steam right now for 60% off until June 10th. So it's literally $9.99 and is, and I cannot stress this enough, absolutely perfect this is not an open-ended long-term game but rather an experience you basically get to play through a three to six hour movie as the star of the story the the premise is this in a future mankind solves the energy crisis by building a reactor on the moon that burns uh h3 uh it's like it's heavy uh, what, hydrogen, there we go, uh, in situ and beams the energy back to Earth with a gigantic laser that is then received and stored and transmitted around the planet. Life is great until one day the grid goes offline without any warning or explanation. Now, years later in a dystopian collapsing society on Earth, A group of scientists working in secret send you to the moon using the last prepared rocket in a Hail Mary attempt to solve the mystery of the moon base collapse and get the power flowing back to Earth. You then play through the entire story, starting on Earth where you must successfully launch the rocket, operating all the instruments in the proper order. Side note, and this is the only spoiler I'm going to give. <clears throat> this is the one thing that kind of annoyed me. The only hint is this. When you get to the point on the base, on the Cosmodrome, before you take off, where you see a picture, like you literally see the plans of like, here's how the rocket is laid out and the things you have to do in what order. Take a picture of that. Like literally screen cap it or take a picture of it with your phone. Do whatever you need to. That one picture you, you should have ready. So have that diagram ready for your takeoff. Once you arrive, so like literally from there, you're literally like they're yelling at you, get running, get running. Uh, 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 you know, you need to get up into the rocket and take off. We're out of time. And you have to do all the things in the right order to make the rocket fly. <clears throat> Once you arrive at the orbitable platform above the moon, you must float around in zero G, attempting to access the equipment and investigate after, you know, a scripted mishap happens. You find yourself hurled through space only with only seconds of oxygen. And you're you're basically like Sandra Bullock in gravity. You have to navigate while dodging some debris and using others uh, to like bounce off of or whatever to launch yourself from. You have to navigate your way to a space elevator where you then have to get it operational and get down to the surface of the moon. Once down there, you end up visiting various sites during your mission. You obtain a laser cutter that allows you uh, to uh, sort of access certain terrain manipulation sort of devices. You build a robot drone companion that allows you to basically co-op with yourself. You literally can, you know, you hit Y on the controller and you... Just freeze where you're at, and now you're controlling your own little drone. <clears throat> and there's certain things where it's like your guy has to be in one spot. The drone only can can access the other spot. And, and together, you're co oping with yourself to o- overcome the puzzles. Um, you operate a moon rover, antenna arrays, a maglev train that's careening off broken tracks, all the while solving 
one missed-style puzzle after another, including operating machinery, overcoming terrain blockages, etc. And throughout, there is a very good story being told through holograms, and you can access pre-recorded messages at certain points uh, that you unlock within the machinery. And more organically, by interacting with everything you find uh, around you, allowing you to piece together the mystery for yourself. You're literally like looking at boards where it says something or <clears throat> uh, um, like you find a magazine, you find a note, you look on the back of it, you look everywhere. <clears throat> This game requires zero setup time whatsoever. It works brilliantly with native keyboard, mouse, or controller setup. It will tell you what the controls are that you need to use. It requires zero prep. It delivers a breathtakingly haunting set of sights and sounds, a top quality story complete with a M. Night Shyamalan level twist at the end, and a post credit scene that is incredible. It's a tidy little treasure that you can start in an afternoon and complete that very same day. It will leave you feeling enriched for having experienced it. Note, the same development company who made this has made a new game, a sequel called Deliver Us Mars, which is set to be published by Frontier Developments as the publisher at some unannounced time later in 2022. The fact that we're in June of 2022 and we haven't heard when yet, man, almost every game that I've heard of that was aimed for 2021, released in 2022, was aimed for 2022, was going to release in 2023. I don't know. I'm wary of Frontier as a publisher. I'm not going to lie. But this game, this this uh, developer company, Conreal or whatever the fuck, they delivered me a perfect game. For a handful of shekels. I, I'm i going to wait to see. Just because I'm really hesitant with Frontier. But I strongly. This is on my wish list. And I can tell you this. Throw down the $10. And play Deliver Us the Moon. The, again. Coming back to the three things I would recommend from anyone Go watch that 1975 interview with Asimov and, and O'Neill. Go watch For All Mankind and play Deliver Us the Moon. It's 10 fucking bucks. And I'm telling you that you will literally message me and say, Kai, I can't believe you you recommended that. I didn't I never heard about it. I was I was Tom Cruise in a billion dollar fucking budget action movie. This was so great. Um, I, now I know for a fact that Wolf has played Delivers the Moon. Wolf, am I overselling this? Wolf? Why is Wolf muted? Hold on. Try again, Wolf. He's not muted. I hear him. I, I can hear him. Uh, we well, that were... was interesting. All right. Say again, Wolf. So you were definitely not overselling this. I found this, um... I think about a year ago. I'd have to look at my uh, my Steam account to see. <laughs> if memory serves me right, it had kind of a rocky launch. Um, it seemed incomplete, but by the time I played it, mm. and of course by the time any of you first now hearing it are going to play it, it's fully complete. I had no issues with the playthrough. It was fucking gorgeous. <laughs> um, I was able to play it at max settings with my old RX 570 that I had. I'm honestly rethinking about playing it again just to see what the new hotness rig I have sitting here will do just to let even more pretty happen. It was incredibly linear, but it's a storyline, so that makes perfect sense. Super detailed. Lots of little Easter eggs that you can find. Um, the There's some that are that you can see. Uh, on the, the Steam Achievements thing. Others, you have to just go and do all the things and be observant, and like you're going to play through it probably a couple times if you're a completionist like that, and it is worth every single second of your time. It is objectively gorgeous. There's puzzle solving that 
some of it's, you know, a little bit of a created a puzzle just for having a puzzle. Others of it is, this is no shit. Like, it makes sense that this is a puzzle like this, like launching the rocket. Um, there's and- certain parts where you're just alone in the desolation of nothingness that is what is around on the moon in certain parts of the base. And it's... I... Kai's not overselling it, and I can't stress it enough. If you want an absolutely gorgeous action movie space experience for ten bucks, I mean, hell, I bought it for more than that. Yeah, I, it was thirty. Shut bucks. up and take your money. Like, go. It was thirty bucks, and it's now available for nine. Go and get this. You will thank me. Anybody else want to hop in on uh, on this? All right. We're going to we're going to circle back cuz there's one thing that um I absolutely had skipped over and that's my bad and that's going to be asset 6. Here we go. Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi. <clears throat> we talked very vaguely about episodes 1 and 2 last week uh and episode 3 just dropped. We're not going to spoiler episode 3. There's a couple things I want to talk about with regard to this show, though. Number one, episode one and two were good, but they were also a little bit of setup. Episode three was the biggest payoff for a fucking Star Wars nerd you could get. And I'm just going to, I'm not spoiling it in general, but I'm going to say this, and you've seen it in the trailers, if you've seen any of the trailers. Obi-Wan and Darth Vader throw down. And that shit is glorious. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to spoil or anything. There's a couple things with regard to the show that I want to address. Number one, <clears throat> I think this is top quality Star Wars in a way that we haven't gotten other than Mandalorian in a while. Number two, I am madly in love with baby Leia. I think she reminds me of my like baby. She's like nine years old, whatever. She's like a little fucking munchkin. She comes up to my kneecap. Uh, she reminds me of my baby sister when my little sister was like a little teeny tiny fucking half a person. Um, the one thing that I will say from from this show is like, man, baby Leia, as somebody that's like three inches tall, manages to run away from full grown adults it, with amazing skill somehow. I, I'm not sure exactly how that works out. That's the one maybe half of a half of a critique that it's like maybe they should do a better job of explaining how this person that's like 11 inches tall manages to run away from fucking full grown men but like what including jedis but like whatever i'm I'm here for it i love the show um this episode with its portrayal of somebody that's both on the empire side that that you end up like all rooting for as well as the whole uh uh um playing out of the 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 obi-wan and darth vader as well as a surprise cameo by what we'll just say quote unquote a jedi and i'll leave it at that and you'll know what i mean when you get there that is somebody that if you're a fan of nerddom you'll you'll know this this comic character and you will fucking love him all great the only halfway whatever, and I don't, I don't know what the whole deal to this is, but I've heard basically there's been some people making like racist comments about the black chick who is like the sort of lead bad guy at at, at I mean like whatever whatever her name is the third sister yes, I I don't understand it like don't get me wrong I hate that chick I want to murder her but like. As a character, that means she's doing a great job as an actor. It's the same thing as hating, uh, I don't know, hating the little fucking blondie boy that played Malfoy or hating J.R. Ewing or hating any person, Voldemort. You hate the character, of course, but you don't hate the actor. She seems amazing. She's doing a fucking incredible job. She's killing it as being the bad guy. If you are some fucking soft-headed sap that needs to send racist shit because of of Star Wars bad guy, in this case bad girl, happens to be black, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I haven't really gotten into any of the other stuff about it. This is just a thing that I literally saw today that there was some kind of clip that Ewan McGregor was like, hey man, 
As a producer of the show, let me tell you, this actor is amazing. And apparently people are sending her like racist death threats or whatever. And it's like, how far have we slipped as a culture? If you were a Star Wars nerd and you love Star Wars, that's like saying you're threatening Darth Vader or you're whatever. It's like, no, it's an actor playing a role. She's amazing. She's a very talented actress. And also... Even if she wasn't, even if she was a bad actress, like, don't death threat people with racist rules. Leave your shit to the side, man. Like, fucking, come on. Grow up. What the fuck? Yeah, there, there's, there's a whole lot of weird, fun-sized, snack-brained people out there who, A, like Star Wars, and B, are total racists and have seemed How? to think that it's fine to talk like that How now. does that work? Um, How are you a sci-fi a nerd and racist? Politics, but I don't know where these fuckers came from, but yeah, it's a thing. How are you a and, sci-fi nerd and a racist? Like we're we should be the you know what? Never mind. I don't need to preach to y'all. Yeah, let's but not I just, focus on this. This, yeah. this is a minority group of people that yes. are being vocal. I mean, there's been black people <laughs> through Star Wars forever. I mean, Lando Calrissian was black. Fucking the voice of Darth, Darth Vader. Vader. Darth James Vader. Earl James Jones. Earl Jones. I mean, come on. Yeah. And and to be fair, I want to be absolutely one hundred percent like clear on this even uh you and mcgregor when he said it he was like this isn't the majority the majority of the fans love her or love to hate her but like this is just a very small subset this is not star wars fans are racist this is just some fucking half a dozen losers and i just gotta say uh, i i'm i'm so i'm embarrassed to say i don't know this actress's name she is incredible she is killing it i absolutely hate her the character, which means she's doing a great job. I hated yeah, Voldemort, yeah. which means he was doing a good job. Go ahead. You'd be terrified if you came face to face with the third sister. That's how good of a job she's doing. Oh hell yeah, she's kick ass. Now, without many spoil, without any spoilers, let's let me get into what you said here. Okay. Okay. So, so you broke the the, the news that. There's a little Leia, about 10-year-old Leia in there, which before the show aired, none of us knew. That but, never got out. But it is in the trailers now, if you go. Because they didn't put yes. out trailers yes. previous to the whatever. But if you've seen agree. the trailers now, you you see baby Leia. But She's like fucking girl, two inches that tall. That little girl is a great 10-year-old Leia. She is so good that I can... I can already envision that that is Leia Organa. She's the Leia that grows up to be the Leia we see in A New Hope. I, I totally believe that. She is that good. She's great. And when I heard Hayden Christensen was coming back to this show mm -hmm. and was going to don the suit, so to speak, I looked at my wife and I said, <clears throat> this could be great, but they have one responsibility and they have to show why the galaxy was absolutely terrified of Darth Vader. How, oh, they In did. In A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, when people said Darth Vader, everybody sh shrank and ran the other way. The galaxy was terrified. We saw that at the end of Rogue One. And then in this episode, that's exactly what we saw. He was totally a badass and mm -hmm. exactly the terrifying villain that we needed him to be. And this is, I watched this whole episode from beginning to end with a giant smile on my face. This took me back to being six years old. Worst grand marshal of a parade ever. You'll get that joke later guys. Um, yeah. So good. And I love Jimmy Smith's as a, uh, as a, uh, I mean, you've seen his character already. You know who he is. He's he's and, uh, a Morgana. He's Leia's I, dad, adopted yeah. dad. Yeah, Bail Organa. He was in the prequels. He, he's yeah. great in all of them. Yep. Uh, and they're also doing things that a lot of people won't pick up on. But, for example, in, I believe it was episode two, when the fake... Uh, the, uh, there was a mother uh, and a uh, son uh, uh, that uh, was getting passage. We'll just yep, say that. Yep. That son, actually, if you look at the credits... He turns out to be a major character in a lot when of the old, up. in yeah. a lot of the old legends books, mm -hmm. Coran Horn. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He is now canon in the Disney timeline, and I have a feeling he's going to have a, a role to play in the Rogue Squadron movie that comes out in a year or two. I. But the, the fact so, that they're weaving that those characters into these stories in such a 
minute, small way. I love that. That is so good. So, episodes one and two were great. Don't get me wrong. I loved them. But there was a certain amount of setup. Episode three, with the big payoff. Oh, it was orgasmic. I mean, was it not, Tweak? It was, totally. It was It was what I have been waiting for since since 1983 quite honestly it this is exactly what i wanted to see since 1983 and like i said i sat there with a huge smile on my face and then i turned around the next day and i watched it all over again and uh sheep postmodernist you're getting an x-wing movie it's called rogue squadron being directed by um i can't think of her name right now but should be coming out in a year or two patty jenkins that's Mm -hmm. it so it's coming Mm -hmm. so just Star Wars, go give Disney Plus the money. If you don't want to, then steal it. I'm not your dad. I promise. Go it's watch worth it. it. It is so good. Yep. Go watch it. Go watch it. Anything else before we move on to? We got to get going to Elite Dangerous and then start in with our games. All right. So- While we're on the topic of Star Wars, just in general, um, just to throw this in there, because the the second game they're starting the marketing hype for it, but Star Wars Jedi <laughs> Fallen Order, despite the fact that it is an EA game, it's fantastic. Yeah, we're going to be covering that soon. And All you, right, you got to play it. So Go we've got uh, real quick. I just want to cover on Deliver Us the Moon. We played you the trailer. Uh, I want to. Uh, did you post in the links all the other links for Deliver Us the Moon, uh, Wolf? Yes, I did. All right. So we have the 11-minute review in detail on it. We've got the three-hour 4K Ultra HD playthrough. And if you're like, hey, man, I played that years ago. Wait, what? There was a there was a post-credit whatever. Uh, the link uh, that is right now going in the chat, I'm sure it's already been in there, but I'm going to post it again. This link right here is a, like a 24 minute long rev, uh, uh, um, post whatever like ending of it and then 11 minutes into it there's like a surprise cre- like post credit mid credit whatever where it throws a little like wait what scene into it mm-hmm. so <clears throat> if you played that game and when you got to the credits you're like alright I'm out you missed a thing Go yep. and at least watch that video because you'll enjoy it. All right. That takes us to Elite Dangerous. Let's see if any of the sound stuff is working at this point. Tech, it's a thing. Here we go. All right, so Elite Dangerous announced console server uh, copies will come in September uh, this year and posted details. There is the link in the chat right there. Let me bring up Elite in the trail in the uh, yeah slideshow. Um, does anybody want to throw in anything with regard to this? I mean, I I honestly feel like it's several months too late for a lot of people they've lost a lot of people but i do want to salute them for doing a like legitimately um you know i I think they they're doing a better job than i would have expected them to do they're doing it way later than i would have hoped they did it but like on balance you're gonna have to decide what that means to you does anybody want to yeah yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's definitely too late. We're what? September would put us at just about six months from the time that they canceled console. And that was about a year. A year and after a half. They, it was May 19th. They definitely suspended it from console. Yep. So really, we've been waiting a long-ass time for anything to come. That being said, this is what we're getting. This We can't move it up any faster, so... It, it, and the fact that they're transferring almost everything over 
complaining isn't going to help. So if 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 we want it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it as soon as the option's available. And I know a lot of other people that are too. Right I on. don't disagree that it's taking so long that a lot of people that were thinking about doing it are going to lose interest by the time it gets here. And right. also, I would say that September is still a fair amount of time away, which with FDEV's history tells me that there's plenty of time for delays or issues Yikes. or problems or Yikes. whatever don't break my heart okay all right so next up we've got obsidian ant did a round table discussion elite dangerous one year on with some other content creators um and then i i honestly felt like he was getting interrupted a decent amount and didn't get a chance to get all of his stuff out um <clears throat> So uh, I even messaged him and said, hey, man, I'd love to hear your thoughts without getting, you know, talked over. And he was like, ha yeah. Uh, and then he yesterday released a video, which we just linked, which is um, it had the thumbnail. Elite Dangerous. If you love it, let it go? Question mark. It's a 13 minute long video with <clears throat> summing up sort of his feelings on where Elite is at at this point. And I think. If I'm trying to give a fair summation of his feelings on the matter, <clears throat> to a certain extent, it's like you have to just let go of all of your old preconceived sort of expectations for Elite. Stuff that they had planned before, their old development plan, just ignore that. That's all gone now. What they have now is what they have. And what they're showing you, which is their roadmap now, is what they intend to give you within the next year. And anything over and above that just just relax and kind of take it as it comes and don't don't you have to eventually give them a reset and say i'm not going to hold these nine thousand things against you i'm just going to take it day to day if if you can't do that quit playing just move on to something else but if you if you want to stay playing elite and you want to not be miserable then just reset all your expectations start fresh now and try to enjoy it as best you can enjoy it for what it is that's what i've been saying for a few weeks now it's it's not perfect but it still does a lot of things that no other game does and you can find yourself having a lot of fun in it still so that's that's where i am with the elite that's how i found a way to back to be able to enjoy it is i enjoy it for what i fell in love with it to begin with but for i enjoy it for what it is not for what i wish it would be or what i wish they would have done or any of that kind of stuff so so I just so in addition to that we have right now there's a cg going on that is paying out stupid amounts of high money like it's paying out like like literally you can make billions of credits yes you the, can the I've been turnout doing it the whole show <laughs> the the turnout still seems ridiculously low so i think we're scarily enough we're getting to a point where even with bribing people, they, FDev doesn't seem to be able to get a high amount of, of turnout to their stuff. Are you seeing a, a, a decent amount of people there in the CG zone, Wolf, on a Friday night? Chat is, chat is extremely active, not oh, only in the CG system, but the surrounding systems. Um, great. I actually had to hop around in my DBX to find a system that was open, that had a spot in a decent position, so I could take this tin can of a Type 9 back and forth without dying just outright. Hey, that's um, fantastic. But it's been, it's been fun. Like, there's been lots of people, you know, calls for aid against uh, gankers that are here, um, people, you know, running close support for helping people get in and out like it's over here in this little chunk of space it is extremely lively and i know on xbox i know right now as we speak there's a pile of opix guys back going back and forth doing the cg and that's a lot of other people there as well that's legitimately fantastic because all week what i've been hearing from multiple content creators and people in the community is holy shit they're giving out stupid amounts of bribe money and still nobody's here so apparently after a slow week on the weekend, man, it's picking up. It could be because it's a holiday weekend. It could be because of whatever. But, like, that's great to hear that it's picking up. Does anybody have anything else on uh, Elite Dangerous before we move on to Nomansky? It is available for 
five bucks on Humble Bundle. So for if you know people that don't have it and you want to try to convince them to try it with you for extremely low stakes, it's kind of hard to beat five dollars unless Epic Game Store gives it away for free again. There we go. All right, we're hopping into No Man's Sky news. Are you muted? God damn it. Everybody Take a drink. drink. All right. So that was the uh, gorgeous uh, video from Reddit user Vigardstrom on Reddit Nomansky. This game is breathtaking. I've linked it for you in the chat, and I've also linked for you the patch notes for the new patch 
Update Leviathan 3.91, which dropped on Tuesday, May 31st. Of note, the big fixes on this are number one, it allows for the expedition completion, and number two, it allows for safe recovery from falling in space, i.e. when you fall through your freighter floor or whatever. Um, this is... Uh, this is fantastic. So generally, the general community reaction to this expedition has been overwhelmingly positive. As always, some don't like the limited time frame access to expeditions, but the event-based content is widely popular. The Steam numbers for this game have been off the charts. We're currently halfway through unlocking Tier 3, which is the A-Class uh, uh, module already been, uh, being unlocked, and we're working on unlocking the S-Class modules. With over a million submissions to community research, according to Traveler at Cyberpunk 2350's data mine estimates of submissions needed to unlock each tier. The gaming press and content creators have been uh, overwhelmingly praising of Hello Games for having the courage to continue to innovate with their free updates to the game. See, for example, Obsidian Ant's recent video praising Hello Games for having the courage to release an expedition that is entirely roguelite-based, completely innovating upon their expedition cycle. Uh, note that this expedition will remain active for approximately five more weeks, ending on July the 5th. So we're, you know, what, at June the 3rd? So you've got like a month and two days left to finish that shit. Uh, Wolf just posted the link for Obsidian Ants video, which is, uh, uh, fantastic. It's, like I said, devs that have no fear, push innovation and boundaries. No Man's Sky. Uh, in addition to this, you can, uh, check your progress. There's a link that I'm posting right now. Here we go. I got it. Copy and paste. There we go. You can check the progress of No Man's Sky community research projects in-game or by downloading the Windows Store phone app or through your browser. This link sends you to the distribution point for the platform of your choice. Like I said, you can do it in browser, you can do it in Google Play Store, you can do it in iOS, you can do it in Windows, App Store, whatever. All of the places. That's good shit. You have still a month and a couple of days. This is uh, an expedition that would probably take you a weekend of playing hard. And since you have, you know, basically, like I said, more than a month left, it's easy to do. If you want to wait a little bit for the expedition to get easier as people level up, that's a valid choice. If you want to do it now, that's a valid choice. Next up, I've got a link. This is to Zane's World. <clears throat> he is a phenomenal content creator for Nomansky, and he's got a video, How to Get a Free S-Class Exotic Ship on Leviathan Expedition Starting Planet. It's a 2 minute and 19 second long video. Super short, to the point, it shows you how to get an exotic S-Class to start your expedition off. That will help you immensely. Also, we've got two posters for Nomansky that I'm about to link for you. Here we go. Um, these were submitted to us uh, in Black Sky Legion by a friend of the show, Zenexia. Uh, here is, let me pull up the, so it's uh, asset 13 and 14. Here we go. Let me pull it up. The first one is right there. Weather warning, incoming storm. Love that shit. If you've played No Man's Sky, you literally see this poster and you hear it in your head. You know, weather warning, incoming storm. And I want to pair that with no free slots in suit inventory. Fucking amazing. I love these. I just, I don't know. I saw them and they tickled me. And so I was like, oh, if you play No Man's Sky, you, you know what I'm talking about. These are amazing little posters. So... The link is in the show notes for both of those if you want to have it for your background or if you want to use it or if you want to go to one of those sites and get them to put it on a shirt or whatever the hell you want to do. <clears throat> uh, next up, we have Asset 15, which is a very short video. No Man's Sky PSVR2 announcement trailer. I'm going to show it to you and then we're going to talk about it.
There you go. That is No Man's Sky PSVR 2 announcement trailer. Now, you might be saying, what is PSVR 2? Well, while some developers are cutting back on VR, others, namely Hello Games, are not only providing VR on the PlayStation 4, which they have all along, but they're also... Now developing No Man's Sky to be compatible with the next-gen PS5 VR systems, which are listed as P, uh, PSVR 2. So, once again, Hello Games hitting it out of the park and doing all of the things. Anybody have any comment with regard to any of this amazing content for um, No Man's Sky or want to discuss their, um, what do you call it? Their uh, um, experiences, let's call it, with Expedition 2. We can always move on and do that, you know, next week. But if anybody wants to hop in now, go for it. I, I, don't, I don't have a PS4 or a PS5, but I'm really excited that they're... they're you know, pushing on and pushing forward with VR support and bringing it to the PS5 with what I'm hoping for is new features and stuff. The only hesitation that I've got on this has nothing to do with End of Man's Sky itself, and that is we don't really know much of anything about PSVR 2 itself. But that's Sony's problem, not Hello Games. Okay. I just, I'm, sh- I'm sure that Hello Games is going to do it properly, whatever happens on that, that front. Anybody else? Man, I wish I could use a VR headset. <laughs> that looks so awesome. Like the closest I can get is using um like I have a Track IR5 set up mm. and I love it. But just the the full on like this is the only thing I see that level of immersion and what not to use that word which is, you know, a bad word to some like that just looks fucking awesome. I just wish I could see it. Oh yeah, I get it. All right. Let's hop into some Star Citizen. Let's test this out here. I think I figured it out. I think I know what I'm doing wrong. Let me test this. Nope. All right. Whatever. Fuck it. Uh, The thing doesn't want to play. I'll have to figure that out later, why the bumpers are not working. Star Citizen News. We're going to start things off right off the bat with a tribute to my man Griff. This was made by Mad Style. This is Griff's Mule. So this is a tribute to both Griff, who you can see on the decal on the side of the mule, and the mule itself. This is good shit. Check it out and have a chuckle. I, I, this just, I love this. People of Crusader. The criminal group known as the Nine Tails have cut off all quantum travel around one of the sector stations. You know I gotta come back. You know I gotta get the racks. You know I gotta get them M's. You know I'm never gonna slack. You know I'm never gonna slack. You know I'm never gonna slack. You know I'm getting in the racks and you know I'll always bring it back. You know I'll always bring it back. You know I'll always bring it back. Crusader security has dispatched forces to resolve this issue. Until then, we advise all civilian ships to avoid this area until further notification. Qualified mercenary forces willing to assist. Contact our outsource manager. Thank you. They want me to go get that cash. They want me to go bring it back. They want me to break it up. Look at Griff on the side of that uh on the on the side of that mule. That shit is legit. Uh, so huge salute to Mad Style. Uh I think that's I don't know. That just that I just thought that was awesome. I, I I particularly love that little whatever. 
Uh, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to link it right here so that you can go 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 support Mad Style. Go sign up. Uh, um, you know, subscribe to his channel and give him likes and do all of the things that people are supposed to do. <clears throat> All right, let's get into Star Citizen. Let's talk about the Invictus recap. So I want to hear people's experiences with the Expo, the Free Fly, the Nine Tails Crusader lockdown invasion event, whatever, the funding, the new player levels, your overall thoughts, all of it. Let's swing around the horn and let's start off with uh, Chad. It was quite an event. Lots of surprises. Uh, they had a test for the Nine Tails thing. I didn't get to participate in the test. I did go to the area, and uh, it's gigantic, massive. It's, I got lost. I got lost, and uh, that was only the first of four platforms. And the first platform is the smallest yep. of the four. Yep. And it, there's multiple buildings, multiple stories, multiple. Just it's just it's just unbelievably huge. It's like take the largest battlefield map and like multiply that like times ten. It's just unbelievably large. And you can also um, see the other platforms from the platform you're on. Then yeah. there's the point, the fact that each of the platforms has a lieutenant that's like a mini boss, like a zone boss for that platform. And you have to kill him and you have to SSE, you know, you toss his body for intel and then you go to the uh, cargo the box. Shuttle. No, you go to the cargo box that's on that platform and you type in that code that you tossed his body for the intel and it'll like then unlock a thing so that you're number one accessing more munitions and ammunition and whatnot and number two that is depriving the enemy from getting the friend or foe IFF transponder code to turn off the whatever so that you're stopping future waves from spawning in. So you do that on the first set of platforms, second, third, and then at the end, you literally have this weird event where you're like hopping on a ship and they're doing a hot drop. You're doing like a combat deployment. Uh, it's like every aspect Dang. of this event is fucking incredible. It does suck balls if you're on a really like a server that's chugging and dying or whatever. Like the, the AI is bad. The experience is bad, whatever. But if you happen to, if you've done it multiple times, I'm telling you. It is painfully bad on a bad server. It is super good on a good server. It is like the be it's better than Nine Tails. It's better than Xeno Threat. It's better than if you're on a good server. Holy fuck, is it fun? Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Chad? I know you had thoughts um, on the numbers, the money, yeah, and the so, players. Yes, of course. So the the Nine Tails event specifically will go live with the point two release at yes. the end of this month, along with several other things. Mm -hmm. So Invictus, so compared to last year for the Invictus, they mm -hmm. had 51,000 new accounts and $11 million during the show. This year it was 119,000 new accounts and almost $15 million. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, account, the servers were absolutely crushed by the incoming amount of new people trying it out for the first time. <laughs> So wait, wait. Let me let me let me hop in up real quick because I just want to say this. I'm always anxious that new people are going to hear this and not have context for it. When Chad says that the servers were slammed and they were, oh my god, I know some people might go like, "Well, what the fuck, CIG? Get your shit together. Why would you not allow for blah blah blah?" Let me just tell you, they do this on purpose. They literally set up this event as a stress test every year. They're trying to push the servers to the point of failure. They let everyone who wants to play the game for free at the same time that they do their biggest expo, at the same time that they do a fucking massive event. That's not because they're stupid. It's because they are literally trying to push the servers to stress test them as much as possible to learn so that they can make the server stronger in the future. So this is not a matter of them being incompetent. This is a matter of them doing exactly what they were trying to do. Take it away, Chad. Yeah, so it was uh, the Warhammer toured in Orison, the first time that it was, it's been in, in an atmosphere. Um, so the Bengal can't fly in atmosphere, so it was orbiting 
Port Olisar above mm -hmm. Crusader during mm -hmm. during this time. And the Warhammer was the same tour as last year, but it was still very cool to see and do. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was, so uh, they, they had they had for the first time they had new ships available for rent real real quick for those who don't know when he says the warhammer he's talking about an idris it's named the warhammer but the, the ship is the javelin. idris or sorry jav god damn it i'm an idiot javelin is that yeah i did the tour three times yeah it's sorry. the same as the one last year so they yeah. didn't add anything new they did but they changed well, around some I, of the I, stuff internally they did. They had a, a couple more areas that you could access this year than last year. Like this year, last year you couldn't access the bathrooms. This year, they there were a couple minor things that they added. I swear to God. Don't forget, yeah, there's they, probably a lot of people yeah. listening that didn't see the tour last year yep. too. So yeah, but I mean, every year that they do this, it's not. I, I you're you're right, a hundred percent, Elix. It's the same tour in that it's the same named ship, but every year there's new details, there's new whatever. So don't just because it's going to be the been same completely ship completely abandoned. Yeah, just because it's yeah. th the same ship next year, don't not go because it's always. I like going, and then the my ma my favorite thing is that guy that's down in the lower level. Every year he gives you a new emote. There's a new thing that yeah. he does. <laughs> whatever. I I'm a nerd. I mean. But but this is the one place in the Star Citizen universe where you have like actual NPCs that are talking and facial expressions and waving their hands around and giving you a story and stuff like that. So it's unique in that way that you don't get that almost anywhere else. Bro, every store I go to, they're like, I'm not even supposed to be here today. Just leave. Just go. <laughs> don't buy shit. But but I, I'm sorry. I interrupted Chad. He was in the middle of his thing. I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned the thing about the warhammer yeah. was the javelin yeah 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 so they had the all the new ships um you could rent so like the scorpius the mule um are available for people to try mm -hmm. and uh everyone loved the scorpius and the mm -hmm. mule is as cute as a button mm -hmm. and it'll be crucial for when when the physicalized cargo grid comes on comes on in about september ish mm -hmm. uh when 318 goes live and hugely and hugely important the vulture was on the shore on the floor for people to see you couldn't yes. fly it you couldn't rent it no. but you could walk around inside not this wasn't a a, 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 a hologram of it this was the full-on vulture that you could walk around climb up the ladders go into the bathroom see all the stuff yeah they did that with the a2 but it was wholly incomplete yeah when they did it, it was more of a frame but this was the, the whole thing it just mm -hmm. you just couldn't rent it and it wasn't functional yet because the game systems to support it aren't in the game yet can i let you um, in on a little secret chad well the mule fits in the back of the my, vulture my my buddy zylo yeah i asked him last sunday uh hey uh what is, does the mule fit in there and, and my buddy zylo shocked some people by spawning a mule on the show floor and driving it onto the back of the vulture and closed the door and it fit just fine. I know I shared that with yeah. you already, but I wanted to share that yes. with everybody else. Go ahead. Yes, it's very cool. They're design it's shock. They're designing their design their ground vehicles and their spaceships to work together. Uh-huh. I know, it's a big surprise. Uh overall it was very good. The new location of Orson was very cool. It was really far outside of the main city, so the frames were better. It was better optimized. It was just lots of fun. Drake had their own thing again this year. And uh, there's just an enormous amount of people. And they, it's obviously financially and, uh, you know, successful. Uh, and the whole month of May made over $20 million. And uh, the game is becoming this runaway train phenomenon that seems to have no ends to its uh popularity people are, are discovering it's more of a game i've had several friends who've come back out of nowhere who are like star system looks like to be looks like to be enough of a game to actually play the game and they're not leaving wait it it almost sounds like you're trying to in some way insinuate that 2022 is the year for star <laughs> citizen possibly i'm confused um <laughs> because someone said it wasn't but you know whatever i was told uh, by multiple so, people that it wasn't right so i've had several friends who have come back out of nowhere who who have tried it again and they like what they see and they're not leaving uh, yeah. and they're having an absolute ball i think as importantly as the amount of money that's coming in and like yeah let's 
CIG is making all of the monies. They're making the trillions of gazillions of quadrillions of quintillions of dollars. I don't really give a shit about that. Like, uh, yay, great, good, nice, go for you, whatever. What's more important to me, because like you could literally have a game like Star Atlas before it failed, uh, of like, hey, we sold three ships for $4 million each, and therefore we made $12 million. Okay, that's nice. But what's more important to me is that a lot of this money is not coming from the whales. A lot of this money is coming in onesies and twosies, $80 here, $100 there, $60 here, $200 there. It's new people joining the game. And not new people in the handfuls, but new people in the thousands. And I I am super, super gratified by that. Yeah. And they're doing wonderful things with all this money. They're actually producing a game. Yeah. Um, at the end, end of the month will be the point two release, which will release, will release a ton of new content for everyone to chew on while 318 goes through testing. Yep. That's next up on the, well, it's two things up on the list. Uh, yeah, I, for the record, after this. for the record, I'm just going to tell you guys a little secret right now. Star Citizen is a scam. Uh, I bought a spaceship game, and they're delivering to me a fully realized, a physicalized, in physics universe. So that's not what I had expected. Uh, give me a lot less, please. Tweaked, what are your thoughts with regard to uh, the Invictus recap, the whole, the events, the the money, the 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 ships you could rent, the nine tails, the and, and I know you have thoughts the server instability and yada yada <laughs> well the server instability is what it is and and like you said it was a stress <laughs> test so i totally get that mm -hmm. and i had some pc full pods that were cause, aiding my issues a little bit so my issues were a little more severe than i think everybody else's probably were at that point in time mm. invictus itself this was my first invictus and it was a lot of fun i basically Stayed the week on Orison, and I toured the the showroom every day. I really didn't rent any ships, per se, because I don't really want to tease myself and fall in love with a ship that I can't afford and then not be able to fly it again. And not only that, but I <coughs> fell in love with a ship that I got called the Scorpius. So I, I don't really want to fly anything other than that. But Tweak, I'll let you in on a little secret. Yeah, I, I'm rich. You want you want ten million? I'll give you money. You can buy whatever ship you like. <laughs> well, I have. I think I left myself like two mil, so I, mm. I'm okay right now. But I just. But I have a, a what I consider a fairly good fleet. I got Gladius. I got you know a Scorpius, the Connie. I, I'm doing all right right now. So hell yeah. But Invictus was great, and I am super psyched for the Siege of Oris and the FPS event. You know me and my my liking of the combat both in ship and on the ground. And I'm, a, I'm really excited to see that that play field is massive with outdoor portions and indoor office portions. And it's just, it's going to be unlike anything we've had in that game to this point. So I want to call out in chat. Dunkel Laura says, uh, uh, every single time I went to the Drake defense con, I only had one button. I was not able to go to the Drake expo. Let me just ask you real quick, uh, Dunkel. So you know that the Drake Defense Con wasn't at the same place as the rest of it, right? Because if you went to the main expo floor where all of the other stuff was, then you were not at the right place. You needed to go, instead of at the Vision Center where the main Invictus, Invictus show was, it was on the other end of the same platform that was August Dunlow Station at the Space Port. Yeah, okay. Just making sure, because, yeah. All right. Um, Wintermute, did you have any thoughts with regard to the the Invictus, the, the Free Fly, the, the Nine Tails, the funding, all any of that stuff? Not really, because I don't tend to play Star Citizen because my PC is just not up to it. So. Fair enough. But I... what I will say, whenever I've seen Star Citizen recently, it looks fantastic. Well, they're doing a ton of stuff with Vulcan right now. By the end of the year, your PC may be able to run it. We'll have to check you in at the next free fly uh, to, to give it a look. Okay. Once they get Gen 12 Renderer and Vulcan up, 
if your ship if your if your computer can play Elite, you should be able to play Star Citizen once that's done. I can't play Elite. I can't oh. play Horizons. Yikes. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna have to then. Uh, everybody check your pockets and we'll see if we can shake some some a couple shekels loose. Elix, your thoughts on uh all of Invictus, the 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 expo, the free fly, the nine tails, the the funding, the player levels, all of it. So I still haven't upgraded my computer for window from Windows 7, so I was told to F off. I wasn't allowed to play. Um so I don't have any personal experiences with playing the game in the past week and change. But what was exciting to me was seeing the number of people who were coming in having problems because shit's broke and having the patience to deal with it and not just going, well, fuck this, I'm out. There were certainly a lot of people that were like that, and that's completely fair. They wanted a more finished experience that didn't get it. You know, they can, you know, wait a year or two and see where we're at then. But there were so many people that were just discovering and thing and going, yeah, I knew it was going to be buggy. Yeah, this kind of sucks. But when I have managed to get in, this is still cool. So, like, I think, I think there might be more i think it might not have been as bad for sig as it looks and the numbers themselves you know speak for themselves they made like what 13 14 million this invictus yeah um uh, they're like they've you know that that's a huge amount of money for you know a week long or a bit a bit more than a week long but you know what i mean so, you know, obviously, like, the, the, the complaints, completely valid, you know, the, the people that didn't like how things were going, it, you know, it all happens, completely valid, I'm not trying to diminish it at all, but there might be more of a silent majority who had a bit of a rough time, but expected a rough time, and they're cool with it, and they bought it anyway. That might be bigger than people are thinking, so it's going to be interesting to see what Invictus does to the rest of this year in terms of player numbers and player engagement. Guy, are you muted? No, I am not. Uh, okay. I had a fantastic time for the Invictus, uh, I got to say. Um, the Expo, I visited for every phase of the event, including DreCon. Uh, the free fly, I had people <clears throat> that I told to check it out that did and had various levels of success and not success. Um, the Nine Tails Crusader event. Uh, so mixed experiences. Twice, not great. Once, really great. And it's one of those where, like, when you see it run right, you're like, oh, this is what it's supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> the the funding, uh, I, I thought, fantastic. The player levels, fantastic. Overall thoughts. On the stress test side of it, I'll be honest with you, I had a phenomenal week in Star Citizen all week long for, like, a week and a half until <clears throat> last Sunday. And last Sunday, every last thing just refused to work to the point where elevators murdered me constantly. Elevators were the bane of my existence. Uh, I'm talking about flying to Everest, <clears throat> calling the ele elevator, backing all the way up to the wall and getting to the side and still the elevator, like when the elevator arrived at my floor, even fucking eight feet away, I would fall through the floor and die over and over and over to the point where I said, fuck this shit. I stopped playing star citizen for the day and I went and played deliver us the moon and had a fantastic time. I came back the next day, played star citizen. Everything was great. So like I had very, I didn't have like so, so experiences. I had great and then horrible experience. It was very, it's swung wildly between good and bad. So I definitely can understand those people who said, hey, man, I had a great time. I don't know what you're talking about because that was me most of the days. 
and I could definitely understand the people that said, this game is borked beyond all belief because that was me one of the days. So, like, I don't know. Obviously, like I said, it was a stress test. Obviously, they're considering, they're continuing to expand upon this. Back in the day, like four years ago, five years ago, they would spawn the javelin and it would crash every server. Now they can spawn a javelin at the same time that they're spawning a bangle, at the same time that they have multiple hammerheads in the verse, at the same time that they're doing an expo event, at the same time that they're doing a free fly event, at the same time that they're doing a Nine Tails invasion event, at the same time that they're hosting all of this fucking bullshit at Crusader with the volumetric clouds. Like, they push it to the fail point, but every year, like, the fail point is twice as far along as it used to be. So it's like yesterday, I could bench press 100 pounds. Today, I can bench press 200 pounds. Tomorrow, I can bench press 400 pounds. Every step of the way, the fail point gets so much farther along than what it used to be. So I just want to remind people of that because that's a thing that I think can can slip through the cracks. Let's move on. We'll talk about the Mule and the Legionnaire, people's thoughts. I have just posted a link with the Anvil Legionnaire question and answers. Uh, let's go around the horn and see who has thoughts with it. Why don't we start with uh, Elix on this one? Yep, I've got a few things here. I just want to dig it up. Um, one quick thing I wanted to throw in just before we go into there. If you logged into Invictus for five days during the event, you now have a forum badge associated with your account, or you should have it. Cool. Um where did we put in the SEA research room for? All right, so moving oh, on yeah, to so the Legionnaire, the Legionnaire stuff. Um, I was looking for it, but I found it. So the, the Legionnaire Q&A is there. We're not going to read through the whole thing because it's just a big, long list. But the things that we found that were really important to point out, the Legionnaire's docking capabilities are basically the same as any other ship with its docking equipment. What it does that's different is it can override the usual permission-based docking system with hacking. And that's what it does. It just goes, you will open the door. I'm not asking. Um, sort of. There is going to be... Being hacked. There is going to oh, be a... Yeah, sort of, except for there's going to be a back-and-forth gameplay where the attacker and the defender have some sort yeah, of... That's that's the next thing I was getting into. There is going to be counterplay where the target being hacked can counter the hack. But it, it's it's different from a normal docking permission situation, which is request docking, docking denied, oh, well, too bad. Now there's we can fight over it. Um, the Before we move on to the other stuff, about the hacking, anything about that? Oh, People want to talk about that. Any no, kind of thing, give like your things, and then we're moving on to Chad's. Yeah. Um, then uh, the last thing I'm gonna well, actually I'll let I'll let Chad talk about the rest of the like uh, Legionnaire stuff because there's only two other points that we pulled out. Yeah, so yeah, the, in the when Legionnaire comes out, there'll be an AI blade that you can actually put in your system to counteract it, act it automatically. Mm -hmm. But that will be in the future. So the Legionnaire does not have de it doesn't have crew facilities. There's no bathroom. There's no. It's basically you go on the ship, do your mission, and come back, and you leave the ship. It's not meant for long term anything. It yep. is a quick attack ship. You get in, get out, go home. Yeah, it's meant to be sort um, of a carrier based launch and execute your mission, and then come back and and you know your your facilities are there. Now it does have <clears throat> the pilot. It does have the hacker. And it does have the eight, quote unquote, and I, what is it? High, what was it? Enhanced. High, in, enhanced drop sh seats. Like what is, do, maybe it has a toilet built into the seat there, enhanced drop seats, who knows? <laughs> but it also does have the ability to have those eight people in full heavy armor. It does have gun racks and equipment and all of that stuff for them and the special you know, docking collar extender from the front that's a universal whatever. I'm right. pretty sure there's going to be a few Legionnaires in the OPEX fleet. Yeah, I think we're going to have some fun with this ship. <laughs> and, and then the docking collar has doors that swing open as to act as, as defensive barriers mm -hmm. if, some, if you're being attacked while trying to board. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all kinds of technical, technical, tactical involvement in getting onto the ship um, if, if someone's trying to fire back at you while you're 
trying to board their ship. A hundred percent. It's it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting. It's small. It's very, very, very heavily armored. It's got a decent shield. I think what you're going to see here is people using this for boarding, people using this as a drop ship, people using this. Now, <clears throat> to be clear, it doesn't have the drop ship capability that some other ships have of saying <clears throat> you can land and deploy a sizable, you know, ground vehicle. You can deploy a uh, Spartan or whatever. Like this is going to be just straight up inf infantry drop, but you can yep. use it as a drop ship for small purposes as as well as the you know the the boarding of a station and or ship yeah it also fit into a polaris and an odyssey so you can take it with you on the polaris and the odyssey you can refuel it and 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 supply it there as well and <clears throat> the mule for what 40 bucks 45 if it's <coughs> Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, forty war bond, forty five, yep. whatever for credit. Yeah, the legionnaire, only a hundred dollars. Much, much, much more reasonable than say a cutty steel, <clears throat> in my opinion. Um, seems like a great oh, little yeah. tough ship. It get, it throws off pelican vibes, hardcore for for you know those of you that know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, tweaked. Your thoughts on the mule and the uh, the legionnaire? Well, the mule's cute and fun and all, but the legionnaire, to me, it's different than the cutty steel because the cutty steel is a fly low to the ground with the guns ablazing and drop your troops off. The legionnaire is a I'm pulling you out of space with an interdiction and docking next <clears throat> onto you and boarding your ship and either handcuffing you or shooting you in the head and stealing all your inventory it's a pirating ship is what this is going to turn into okay i dig it anybody else have thoughts they want to add on the mule or the lego before we move on all right so next up we've got bar citizen day events let me pull up asset 17 I've got the info on that but yeah it's... here we go nope I posted the wrong one. Where the hell did I post? Uh, all right. Never mind. I we do not link. have the. Uh, yeah, that's not the link. I was looking for the art, but that's fine. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, there is the. Yeah. There is the link for the Bar Citizen World Tour. It's been more than two years since we've had the opportunity to spend time with all of you in person, and while we will not be together for Citizen Con, we cannot uh, hold out another year. For this reason, we plan to kick off a robust Bar Citizen World Tour this summer, perfectly coinciding with the in-lore holiday First Contact Day. We would also like to take this perfect opportunity to coin a new out-of-game annual holiday, International Bar Citizen Day. We'll celebrate this inaugural new holiday by hosting Bar Citizen events simultaneously near all of our development studios <clears throat> the very same weekend. We're excited to see as many of you as we can in person as we begin the road to 4.0 as outlined in the recent letter from the chairman. We've selected some great venues for the inaugural event, all of which offer both indoor and outdoor options to be con uh, conscientious of the pandemic. <clears throat> Check out the details for each location event below, and we hope to see you there. Uh, not near one of the studios? Don't worry. We're coming to you throughout the rest of the year. Check out our post on Spectrum to submit suggestions for cities, venues, and the events for the community team to visit <clears throat> this year. Lastly, we plan to offer some super sweet and exclusive goodies for those of you who attend events this year, where Cloud Imperium staff is present, uh, and we have... Uh, and, and we say sweet, we're talking about in-game sweet. So come out and say hello. We sincerely cannot wait to finally see you all again in person. So <clears throat> you can go see the uh, the the lovely, uh, amazing, wonderful, uh, uh, sexy Chris Roberts, Sandy Roberts, uh, Aaron Roberts, uh, Disco Lando, uh 
Jared Acapello. So sweet. So sexy. Uh, oh, what the hell is that guy's name? Nightcrawler? Night Stalker? Shit. The guy who does the, the forums. He's the big boss of the Spectrum. Nightcrawler? Night Stalker? It doesn't specify any particular names of people who are going, but yeah, yeah. we can assume they're probably going. Yeah, yeah. Th these people are going to be at the different events all over and around the world. I know for a fact Jake is because I w was talking to him about it. Um, I uh, had uh, got to be at a, a Bar Citizen event last weekend where it, Jake was there, Zyla was there, Night Stalker? I, I'm so sorry, man. You were fucking awesome. Was there uh, uh, um, Disco Lando? Great group of guys. Who's that guy that he did that that one special uh, SCL where he was just on the the one talking about the, the the AI stuff recently on the roundtable, and he did the one where they were talking about the um, uh, uh, that one where he created a custom AI sort of character, and he literally showed like the layers of like first you have to put it in you know on a plane, then you have to put it you know in in a in a verse then you have to give it these different levels of um uh, shit i'm 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 so bad at names yes <clears throat> yes i made a nice piñata of names uh but like these guys were there and you could talk to them and they were giving away prizes and it was a very cool event like uh, i got a uh, a uh, scorpius out of the event but like had even had i not it was worth it just to be there and, and to talk to these people and to hear very cool and interesting behind the scenes off the books stuff where it's like, yeah, here's a lot of general stuff, but here's a couple of little hints on things. Like when Zylo goes, yeah, man, let me spawn a, <clears throat> a, 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 a mule and see if it fits in a vulture. Hey man, we have some information for you about Pyro, or we have some information for you about the Bad New Merchant Man, or whatever, and it's that's fucking good times. That's amazing and exciting. I know that uh, Goose, what is it, Goose IPA, Goose Goose Foundry, Goose whatever that 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 beer place in Chicago, they're hosting Goose Island. Goose Island, they're hosting one. That a bunch of the Soul Citizen guys are going to. That's going to be amaze balls. I know that. <clears throat> uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jake. I think he's going to the one in Austin. Jake's in Austin, right? He's he's going to that one. Yeah. Um, like, you know, there there's one in Los Angeles, California, Austin, Texas, Montreal, Quebec, Manchester in the UK, Frankfurt, Germany, uh, and I know again there's there's one that's happening in. Um, in Chicago as well, like that's not even listed on this list, but it's it's going to be a great fucking time. Uh, anybody have thoughts on 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 this event? If you are able to go to one of these, and especially if it's an outdoor venue, because that's so much better. Like the Texas one looks absolutely baller. Um, if you have the opportunity to go, and it's not going to be a like major logistical road trip situation definitely go and especially when they say like we're going to be taking this on the road to locations near you later in the year it's not, not necessarily just going to be the five you keep an eye open for this because you just get to talk to the devs and like they're off script they're allowed to talk to you sometimes they'll get a little loosey-goosey with the alcohol and maybe say a few things that they're not supposed to and just ask you to keep it quiet. Um, but it's just a great time because they really are passionate about the project and they're passionate about meeting the backers. So, yeah, it is, like, it's probably, I would say it's almost a better time than, than you could have playing the game. It's At a least for a little while. It's a fantastic time. Anybody else? All right, Chad, take over. Uh -huh. So next is the Galactic Galactopedia update. Every week or two, they update a whole bunch of stuff for planets and locations and characters and people and all the all the in-game lore for all the in-game lore people. Uh, and this and this time was no different. Uh, there's a, a, a in-game and lore story about the first Tavarian senator in the UEE. 
as well as a bunch of updates to a whole bunch of planets and locations in the verse. And that that isn't that Tavaran Senator. There's like a Tavaran Senator now that's trying to run for president, right? Isn't there like soon ish? At the next election, I think, so. I, th I think so. It's been a year or so <laughs> since the last one. Yeah, right. yeah. The last one was the the lady that's big into AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody have anything uh, on the Galactopedia uh, before we move on to three point seventeen point two and the road to four point zero? Because that's one everyone's going to want to get in on. All right, do it, Chad. Okay, so the road to 4.0 release schedule. So some a player posted what their thoughts were on the release schedule, and, and Jake Acapella said, Nailed it! <laughs> this is the current plan. They'll have to depend upon the success of 3.18 PT, of course. Mm. So the schedule is 3.17.2 uh, hits the live, hits servers at the end of June. At the same, at simultaneously, the 18 PTU Evo Evo PTU starts its two to three month testing cycle. Q3 patch September ish, 318 goes live. A Q4 patch at the end of the year, 319 goes live. What's going to be in 319 has not yet been specified. Uh, 4.0 Evo begins at the end probably of June, December. We'll probably go into Q1. And then sometime in the first quarter of all things work out, Q4, Q1, patch 4.0, which includes Pyro, will go live. Woo! And that will complete server meshing, at least the static version of it, as in the Gen 12 renderer should be mostly, if not completely complete, in 3.18 when that launches as well. If not, it'll just finish up in 3.19. Wait, so you're saying 4.0 is going to be hitting Evo? Probably before the end of the year. Yeah, but this isn't the year for. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what thoughts do you have specifically, Chad? And then we'll go around the horn on. So, just real quick, I want to throw in. A, there's been a little bit of drama over. I think and and less drama than I thought it was going to be, over stretching out and an extended Evo for three eighteen. Um. <clears throat> Like, literally, Salty Mike put out a video of trust the process. This is all going well. This is all working well. This is this is exactly what they needed to do. Yes, test it. Don't throw out something that's half done. But, like, this process of, like, less communication about nebulous shit that's farther out and more concrete, this is happening over this time – is good. This process that they're doing, this road to 4.0 is good. This adding in this 317.2 is good. Like I I legitimately was like, "Wait a second. I'm I'm listening to Positive Mike. I'm listening to a guy who's saying they're doing it right. Get off their backs, let them do it." And I'm like, "Yes, I agree with this man. Listen to this man." What did you think, yeah, Chad? It was I, I watched Salty Mike's video. It was stunning. I've never seen the guy smile more in my life than during this video. He was just almost giddy that that years of work is finally coming together. That there they have a, a concrete uh, plan, and that is realistic. That isn't another pie in the sky fantasy like it has been in the past. Mm. Uh, the two to three month. Uh, Testing cycle for 318 is absolutely what they need to do because it's a gigantic step with persistent entity streaming, mm -hmm. the physicalized cargo, the salvage, all the all that goes along with it, the dozens of ser additional services that will have to be would be working together mm -hmm. uh, needs to go through through this whole thing, the replication layer, all of it. Um, so yeah, it's it's this year is turning out to be an amazing year for a Star Citizen. Hell yeah. Elix, what do you think about this 317.2, the road to 4.0, Salty Mike being happy, dogs and cats sleeping together? It's pandemonium up in here. So um, I think to me, like the most exciting thing was finding out that 317.2 was coming faster than expected. It was, you know, they expected to be live in a month, mm -hmm. give or take. Mm -hmm. Um 
the uh, the other thing that came to me was like following this schedule. If you allow for a month to six weeks, give or take, on public PTU, once they've had a full once they've had a full cycle on Evocati, that would put three eighteen pretty much on track to be released on or shortly after <laughs> CitizenCon. Didn't you call that? I like no, not not three eighteen the number, but with you know having persistence, you know having a lot of the big things because they you know maybe somebody didn't call it, but they're looking to line up a lot of the big guns mm-hmm. for you know early Q four, meaning like the the efforts of a Q three patch cycle. Oh yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and uh, as as for as for salty Mike, I think you pretty much were nailed it. Where having tangible deliverables with a timeline that extends months, not years, means like that's something he can grab onto and say, "This seems probable. This isn't wishy washy. They're making very definite promises, and there is a very rational chain of information." connecting where they're at now to where they're going to be yeah but go ahead guy yeah no i had called that for sitcom griff had lady rain cloud i think you had chad had like a lot of us in the community had just everybody was calling us nuts well all right here it is uh tweet what do you think about all this I don't see how anybody could be unhappy about this. I mean, here CIG comes out and says, okay, guys, 3.18 is going to have so many systemic changes to the game that we're going to test the living shit out of it for months and months and months before we try to put it in live so we don't wreck your game. Hmm. That alone would make me go, okay, they're they're trying to do it right. But then they say, oh, and because of that, 3.17.2 3.17.2 is coming with new mission types, mm-hmm. the Siege to Orison, new Lagrange stations, moved around stations. I mean, so much content coming in point two uh, to tide us over for 3.18 that uh, <clears throat> imagine, imagine if that would have been the case in that other game for hey, all those years. I, hey, hey, tweet, I don't see how anybody can look at the short term development of this game, the next two patches. And not have total confidence in what CIG is trying to do. Hey, Tweak, not just new wrecks on the planet side, but actual NPCs running around, yeah. running around. And yeah. Like, what? Yeah. NPCs yeah, on the fucking navigating on the planet surface? What? Not just in bunkers? What? Uh, Wolf, what do you think about all this stuff? You excited? I'm hearing a lot of progress. And every time that I've been able to see progress with it which has been very apparent in the patch notes and and hearing everybody talk and and whatnot it i don't see how anybody can be upset because progress is progress and that road to 4.0 they are they're not walking it they are fucking running it like a marathon runner and I can't wait to see what we're actually going to finally get for that stage. There's a bunch of new stuff. I don't know what I'm going to be interested in, but I'm going to take a look at it, because why the hell not? Right on. All right. So next up, uh, Chad, we've got the monthly reports. I'm linking them in the chat here. Why don't you just, uh, you and Elix, hit off a couple of points. Right. and Okay. Uh, yeah, the monthly report, it was, oh, so... See, last month, the UK, there's just some highlights. There's, it's a gigantic post, and it'll take you all of, like, a long time to read it. But here's some highlights. Uh, UK team began improving damage maps on all the ships in preparation for salvage. Um, an unannounced ground vehicle path progress in the final art and design, and a new ship entered early gray box stage. They haven't named it. The Banu Merchantman continues to move through gray box and has seen tremendous progress. Let me, uh, but, well, hold on. Let me interrupt real quick here. Again, under the heading of you should definitely go to Bar Citizen events, even if they're digital online Bar Citizens. Uh, a little birdie told me last weekend that, quote, number one, the Banu Merchantman is way farther along than people think. 
And number two, it's got a big stick. Now, in the lore, the Banu Merchantman, the in the in, in the lore of Star Citizen, the Banu used the Merchantman fleet as their battleships during times of war and as their, you know, uh, principal sort of uh, commerce whatever ships in times of peace. So between that hint that the Banu Merchantman is way farther along than anyone knows and Sandy Roberts tweeting a little thing from the fucking chalkboard or whatever marker board <clears throat> with like Gib Merchantman, please, and a little sad face. I'm going to go out on a limb and say my prediction is Alien Week is coming up. I think we're going to get some big news, if not an actual merchant man on the floor for you to walk around and look inside of. Maybe not entirely completed, but largely like uh, maybe, you know, maybe you can't walk around inside because I, I know the inside has those little things that are like hover elevators, escalators that are like hovered. They take you to different levels. Maybe it's not completely whatever, but maybe just the shell, the outer shell where you can see it from the outside. I think we're getting massive merchant man news during Alien Week and calling it now, Banu Merchant Man for IAE. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree completely. Hell yeah. I, that in the in the Corsair. Yes, for sure. And the Vulture. Yeah. Well, IAE yeah. would Before. be perfect time to have the Merchant Man come in because Cargo Refactor. Yeah, it's happening in 18, so before IAE. Well, I mean, at the time of yeah. now that it's roughly the same time. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I have a curiosity about the merchant man. Sure. So per the lore, it's got two distinct roles. I'm wondering if you can configure it for being, you know, the merchant man or as a warship. So the way that the Banu handle their shit. I don't think that they really go with like variants the way human technology is. It's just that their ship is powerful enough because it's so mahusive to be a battleship and at the same time has all of that cargo slash sales front whatever. Like this, this ship is uh, when, when I, I, I can't do it justice, Wolf, when you see the actual like size layout because they you can go and see diagrams of like this is what it looks like compared to these other ships. It's just it's a, it's a floating city, so it's like an aircraft carrier has a big stick, although it doesn't quite. It's not analogy. It's more like a, a a battleship back in olden ye olden days because the battleship you know was the big gun in in and of itself, and also had enough storage space to hold a lot of whatever. So yeah, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, the Banu Merchantman. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to show because it has changed several times in development. It's changed size. You know, it, it's blown up much larger compared to what it used to be at past times. But there's a few things that I think they probably will try to keep. And one is that, according to the lore, the original description was that the the nomad the Banu are. Like they're kind of nomadic trading people. The their lore has changed a lot since that original description, but that was kind of what they were meant for. And families would live out of a banning merchantman, like it's their caravan vehicle essentially. Yeah, they're like and they nomadic go from clans. place to place selling their shit. And the other part is that it's got guns enough to defend itself, but they kind of are sort of hidden when normally, and then pan when the Banu Merchantman is threatened, panels open and the guns pop out, and it goes, "All right, business time, motherfucker." Because the idea is it you don't want it to appear threatening with big ass guns on the cash register. Yep. All right, Chad. Uh, let's finish up the monthly reports. We got to close this out. Okay, the uh, Argo SRV, the tow truck of the Star Citizen Universe, began production and is nearing white box complete. In the U.S., the team continued on the Drake Corsair. The, the ship's build-out is done, and now they get to fill it up with stuff. 
Uh, the Gen 12 progress is going well. Stuff like volumetric fog on the ground, as well as improvements in texture rendering for the planets and better cloud tech and just all the stuff is going very, very well. Um, there is progress made on the ground vehicle real world physics rework. Mm -hmm. so that the vehicles won't be, be climbing walls vertically anymore. It'll actually resp it'll slide down the, the hill, and, and they won't jump and bounce and float and fly and tumble. They'll actually behave more like you would expect a, a ground vehicle to behave. Mm -hmm. And then there's the 600i and Mercury derelict settlements, uh, which, got, which are progressing well, will be, will be located on Daymar. Mm -hmm. and should be included in the point two release with, again, set in, uh, nav, mesh, nav mesh working for NPCs. Mm -hmm. And they're testing the those environments right now. There's air updates for FPS combat, doing a lot of additional behaviors like bad guys only protecting themselves and good guys trying to avoid killing civilians and protecting others. Um, a rework, the rework of Lorville's cityscape is, is ongoing and is doing well. And there are some additional updates and bug fixes for Arena Commander uh, and then a lot of other stuff in the, in the report. But that's, those are the big things. There's also this Gordon 42 monthly report, which currently is only on email. Um, are you muted, Kai? Yeah. But um, yeah. The, uh, the thing is with that, I'll... The Squadron 42 monthly report is often a lot less interesting because they don't talk about spoilery shit. Yeah. So, so a lot of it is, you know, X team worked on a feature that is key to, you know, a feature that is key to yes. the the story. 100%. And so like, we're oh, okay, cool. So we're not really going to cover the Squadron 42 reports because all they're telling you is that they're still doing work. When they get to the point where they flip the switch on 42 and they're actually telling us stuff in the ramp up to the delivery of it, then we're definitely going to get more into that. Jump Point also came out, which we're just going to say for those of you subscribers, enjoy it. It's awesome. We just want to acknowledge that it came out, but obviously it's a thing that's for the subscribers, so they should enjoy that. And uh, I've got a link that I'm posting right now in the chat. This is from Reddit user Cybertill. Nostalgia time. A look at what the Aurora MR, Freelancer, Avenger Titan, and Cutlass Black, Black looked like in 2013-2014. Check out this video. It's a couple minutes long. It is amazeballs. You will, it'll blow your mind when you see how crude and rudimentary the cockpits were of these ships and like walking around in them was in 2013, 2014. Star Citizen has come a hell of a long way. And that's going to take us into the ISC. We're going to play it for you and then close out the night with a wrap up. So check this out. Hey everybody, the upcoming 317.2 patch looks to bring with it a variety of new gameplay opportunities, bug fixes, and quality of life improvements. And one of the ways it aims to do that is to include important evolutions of mission systems you may already be familiar with. On this week's show, we're looking at two important expansions beginning with the addition of delivery missions specific to those unafraid of breaking the law. Currently in uh, in Star Citizen, we have our uh, delivery missions that everyone knows. They're only for legal, law-abiding citizens. We have no missions for someone who's on the wrong side of the law, someone who lives out of grim hacks. And in 317.2, we will rectify that by adding our illegal delivery missions. The illegal delivery missions uh, in 317.2 are uh, are going to function somewhat similarly to the legal ones, but they get run through a different organization. You will be running them through Redwind. You will have to build up your reputations with them. They will test your trust. They will see that you're reliable by doing fairly legal things at the beginning, and eventually they will give you one of these missions where you have to do something a bit dodgy. And based on how you do that thing, they will either open this career path for you or not. 
there will be some risks involved. You will have to visit some really nefarious locations, some drug labs, some stashes where generally they're not populated by your lawful citizens. So you might encounter some people doing similar missions that are not very favorable to other people doing them. You might bump into them. You might have to end up in a fight or maybe you join up on other adventures. The other more more fixed um, risk factor is the chance of getting interdicted a lot more. So you will have to make sure when you get interdicted, you pretty much have to run for it. If they find the drugs on you or whatever illegal things you're moving, that will end up in you going to prison or in a fight or having to run for your life. And obviously with the additional risk, there will come additional rewards that the legal side of the career delivery missions will not give you. Looking ahead, uh, we're also looking to add different uh, sizes of parcels to delivers, including a small handheld items that the player can stash in their inventory and all kind of other items that whatever, whatever you can think of, uh, this is open-ended. We'll, we'll find cool things to add in there different uh, objects, different type of penalties if you get caught with them. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll make it fun. Obviously, this is not the end of delivery missions. We will keep exploring and finding new things to add. We'll be making stuff interesting for everyone who is in this line of work in the universe. Whether they are on the legal or illegal side of things, we'll find something cool for them to move from point A to point B. These new missions from Redwind are only the first in a new initiative to add more gameplay opportunities to those who want to play outside of proper society's rules and look to make their debut in the upcoming Alpha 317-2. But up next, here's a phrase you may not have heard around here in some time. Service beacons, specifically combat assist service beacons. They've been due an upgrade for some time and they're about to get their next one. Let's find out more. With the current state of the combat service beacons, we like that it's content for players to go out and shoot a, a ship gun at something. Like, it's combat, and that's fun and engaging and interesting. We like the concept, but not its current execution. Service beacons are ways that players and NPCs can request assistance from the player or create missions for the players. We don't like that there's not a whole lot of variety in them. Uh, you generally are fighting kind of the same ships. I'd say one of the biggest problems is that there's no frame of reference to the player in terms of like what they're getting themselves into before they go. So the only indicator that the player has as to how difficult or challenging the mission's gonna be is what the mission's paying. So the more that it pays, the more difficult the mission will be. And if as a new player, you don't know that or know that scale, you don't have any concept of what you're getting yourself into. What we are going to be doing is basically making it so that there are now 10 levels of difficulty for these combat service assist beacons. And when you go to accept them in your contract broker, you will be able to actually see that you are accepting anywhere from one to 10, depending on your reputation with the organization running these service assist beacons. In this particular case, uh, difficulty one might be something as easy as go save this little relatively undamaged ship from an Aurora or something. Pretty easy, pretty starter, something that you should be able to handle. As you do more of them and rank up, you will unlock higher and rarer um, variants up to difficulty 10, which should be something on the lines of like, oh, there is a relatively damaged ship being attacked by either a small group or an Idris or something quite threatening. And that mission should basically mean that when you are accepting it, you immediately say to your friends, everybody hop in, we're going to go and handle this together. That to us is kind of the key goal is that those upper difficulties start getting people doing these together as a group and making the game feel more multiplayer, even in these simpler, smaller missions. We're pretty excited for this update. Uh, it has been a long time coming. Um, we're hoping that it will make this uh, this piece of content considerably more engaging, something that players can 
um, have a bit more fun with and will want to engage with more. Um, and it has served us uh, quite ably as a method for ramping up a new uh, designer so that we can start producing more and more content for you in the future. Um, we are currently aiming for a release with 317.2. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that there will be more non-combat opportunities for aspiring criminals when illegal delivery missions come online that the combat assist service beacons are getting a multi-stage glow up that'll make it easier for players to prepare for what's ahead. And that you can call the 8th the 7th, but we, re we all really know what's up. I guess technically we learned that last week. Now, don't forget that First Contact Day and International Bar Citizen Weekend are both upon us. Check out the RSI website for details. And then after that, it's Alien Week. Yeah, we're in the can't stop, won't stop corridor now. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. Here are a few more shots of the currently under construction seventh floor of the Manchester Goods Yard building, future home of CIG UK. And we'll see you all here next week from the 8th, which is actually the ninth stories up. Don't, don't, don't cut me off. All right. What did we learn this week? Jared looks damn good in a vest. Uh, You're still here. Oh, go. Oh, it's Disco Bueller's day off. God damn. All right. I've forgotten that that was on there. Holy shit, I'm tired. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go around the horn. Thoughts on ISC. Let's start with you, Wolf. Uh, it's always fun to see Jared pop out and just talk about all the, the fun stuff. The energy he has is just, <clears throat> it's perfect. I I can just i need to scroll back and watch several others in the past just to see the the progression of everything and and you know wrap my head around all that has been done and it's just i think the best part of this is it's showing him in the new building like last week it had him um or the week before it had him in uh on the street looking at it now he's walking around in the vest with a hard hat and whatnot it's just like should this guy really be here maybe maybe well i mean he's gonna He's going to work here, blah, blah, blah. Like it, They're just fun. I mean, it's a hot pink construction vest. That's got to sound official. Uh, I mean, he's going to stand out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Tweaked, what'd you think? They're telling me I can, like, legit be Han Solo. So you're telling me I've got to smuggle this, this batch of spice in the bottom corridors of an MSR and get through that blockade that they're trying to interdict me and get down to the planet without the, the popo pulling me over and sending me to the pokey you know it's you get to be han solo and like smuggle some illegal shit that is brilliant the fact that you can like physically have the packages that they will find and everything it's different levels of penalties it's just it all sounds good and then the beacons that the beacons like they said they're fun they are some of them are even kind of hard if you're by yourself because there's just so many ships coming from each direction but an idris it make well uh, it, to have an <laughs> idris yeah you're going to be needing a team to take down an idris. i've taken down an idris you know it, with the xeno threat and you're not doing that by yourself so mm -hmm. the fact that they again want to try to get people to play together and i love that about this game When we pick up some random people to smuggle in the MSR and I'm there playing chess with them, you better tell them, let the Marine win. <laughs> All right. Felix. So, yeah, um, you know, expanding more mission types and just giving more diversity. Just it. every time you add something to the sandbox – you're adding a new variety of activity for players to be engaging in when they encounter other players engaging in any one of the different activities available in the game. And when you start mixing and matching things like that, you're going to get different results almost every time. So adding more of these things is just, that's more fantastic. And making the beacon missions more clear about what you're getting into, you know, that. That can't hurt anybody, so like this is good. I dig it. Chad. It's all great. It's, uh, more stuff to do, more variety. 
more sandboxy things to get involved with you and your friends. Coming soon to Star Citizen I mean, AO. Think about what that means, that they are updating and putting more love and care into delivery missions. And and think about oh, yeah. the fact that the, the reputation system that they just added in, they're actually, when they added in the reputation system, they got some people complaining, they're like, oh, you're adding that in, but you're not doing anything with it. That was and, and, in, prefer- in, yeah. in, in preparation for this. They're doing something with it. Yeah, and and he said that they actually allowed them to build a system where they can generate more content in the future, which Faster. is amazing. That's cool. The last thing I'll say about this was mm-hmm. the one thing that stood out to me watching that video was the confidence of all of the devs that were speaking. They were so confident in what they were talking about and so passionate that you could tell they liked, they believed, and they enjoy what they're doing and it it really stands out a lot to me i guess because of what i've been used to for so long now but it's just eye-opening how how good they all are 100 percent. let's go around the horn we have to close this show out because we've been going for about 36 hours now uh chad what do you have that you'd like to add on before you say good night to the beautiful people um welcome to the air star citizen Hell yeah. And uh, it's been a hell of a ride, and it's going to get even better. Uh, Buckle your seatbelt. Hell yeah. Wolf. I just want to thank everyone for joining us. It's been a hell of a ride tonight. And um, yeah, don't expect the video to be viewable right away because oh, we're going to have to trim some shit. Fuck all of that. I'm going to... At first, it takes like eight hours for YouTube to trim their shit. Nothing that we oh, no, had on here. <laughs> Nothing that we had on here should have been needed to be blocked or trimmed. It's all, it was literally just trailers that are publicly available. You know what? Never mind. Uh, Elix. So, as much as things are moving fast, I just want to remind everyone that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's important to have patience because time will take, you know, things will take time. But I definitely agree that we're we're picking up speed and we're getting close to some pretty great, great things. So right on tweaked. Well, first thing I'll say is if you haven't already, everybody should run out and watch Obi-Wan. Don't listen to the trolls on the internet that are complaining about the story and such. I've read all those reviews and they don't understand the story. That's the problem. So go watch Obi-Wan and enjoy these space games. There's a plethora of great space games out there, both multiplayer and single player. Go have some fun. It's a good time to be a sci-fi fan. Hell yeah. Oh, and next next week, just a quick mention, I discovered the new Firefly. I, I discovered a, I should say, a friend discovered, turned me onto a book series, and I listened to the first book. It's Firefly all the way. So we'll have to talk about that at some point. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Right now in the the live chat, I am posting for you. This is the link for an amazing half hour interview that was on public television in 1975 that will, if you're anything like me, it will change your fucking life. Go and watch that video. You need to see it. Uh, After that, I'm going to say this is the link for... For All Mankind, Seasons 1, 2, and 3 trailers. Go, like, if there's one show. Don't get me wrong. I I love you, Tweaked, and I love Obi-Wan. I swear to God I do. But For All Mankind is, like, next level. It's it's, it's the prettiest girl. it's, It's comparing the prettiest girl in your high school to the prettiest girl on the fucking planet. And lastly, a absolutely perfect game that you can right now get on Steam for nine bucks. Uh, um, <clears throat> Deliver us the moon. Go and get that. And I sometimes people are like, I don't have time for another game. I don't have time for another one. It's a game that'll take you three hours to beat. But it's fucking three hours of perfection. It's like, you know, <clears throat> going to see Top Gun in the movie theater. It's worth it. Fast Card FC from Soul Citizens in the house. Hello, hello, sir. Tweaked. Fast Card is asking you, what book was that that uh, <clears throat> that you're referring to? Just give the teaser, and then we'll talk about it more next week. 
It's called Tyche's Reach. T Y C H E S Reach. That's the name of the ship, and it is like an. It's like I said, it's Firefly in every good way. Hell yeah! All right, we're out of here, people. We love you all, but Nanu, it's Nanu. time for bed. Good night.